Welcome back to episode 145 of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. My name is Josh. I'm here as always with Troy. Are you surviving, Troy? What's the, the update on the plague here? I'm trying. I'm, I'm pretty convinced I now have the plague. I thought I was doing better after the last show, but actually tonight I feel I feel like I'm on the mend tonight. But the last four to five days have been rough. Kind of going up and down, huh? Up and down, shivers, chills, breaking my fever, sweating all over, sore throat, coughing. Don't have COVID. Have taken three COVID tests, so that's a good thing. But man, I gotta, I gotta shake whatever I got because this is getting ridiculous. Do you think it's because you're just that nervous about our artifacts redemptions and <laughs> seeing if it's going to be the player who shall not be named? Or I hope, I hope, I, hope my body wouldn't do this. Getting nervous over that. Holy cow. Well, you have avoided COVID, but it's hit my house. So my teenage daughter has COVID. Now, the one thing about your teenage daughter having COVID is she never is around us anyways. She just hides in a room or in the basement. So kind of nothing's changed, to be honest, around here in the Madigan household. But hopefully she gets better soon. It's You could tell that she's feeling a little bit better because she was bored today. She was like practicing her musical instrument, which never (laughs) happens. She went outside to go check the mail. And it's like, oh man, you're yep. uh, you're sick of laying in bed and watching TV at this point. Well, Troy, on Christmas Day, just another reminder that part three of our Cup Masterclass is dropping. So that'll be our episode for that day. So we still haven't missed one. It'll probably happen at some point. But the streak continues now without 145 episodes strong, without missing a release date. Uh, that, that's kind of cool. Uh, Mitch Grotman. The cup expert, the cup expert, I should say, uh, did a fantastic job and really excited for you all to hear that. One more thing before we get started, because we have a loaded show. It is cup release day, as a fact. Uh, we're recording this on Wednesday the 20th. A uh, lot to talk to about today, particularly around the cup. But again, before we get started, a reminder that the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a Patreon podcast, which means that we rely on support from listeners like yourself to help us cover our show expenses, continue to produce more and hopefully better hockey card content and help fund initiatives, even in a small way to grow the hockey card hobby. It's very easy to support us. We use Patreon. You can become one of one of our out of 199 supporters, be one of the first 199 supporters of our show. It's $5 a month. You get access to our Discord server and some of the other fun stuff that we do uh, from that community. Very active and lively group. Lots of people chatting in there on a daily basis. To support us, you can go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com, and there's a Become a Patron link at the top of the page, or just skip that and go to Patreon's website, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. There's a link in the show description for the podcast app you might be listening to us on, or in the YouTube uh, description as well, and then in our Instagram and TikTok profile, there's a link there. We have one new out of 199 supporter since our last show, Night Night. Not as in like good night, but as in Vegas night night. Uh, thank you very, very much for your support. We greatly appreciate you. And uh, welcome to the Gong Show Discord. All right, Troy, you ready for the game plan, bud? In my effort to not cough on camera, I have just <laughs> said half of the introduction on mute, which is always fun. I'm sure it was great, Troy, and, and <laughs> everyone right. at home loved it. But yeah, now for us, what's the game plan? Now, now let's try this again. On today's show, we begin with the almost greatest NHL player to wear, number 45. Then it's off to Hobby News. Next, we are joined by Billy Cilio to talk about 2021-22, the Cup, which just released on Wednesday, December 20th. This is followed by new product releases, and we end the show with our PWCC weekly preview, followed by any personal pickups. Okay, Josh, got to get rolling here. Voice is ready. I'm, I'm not falling right. asleep. I'm not sweating profusely. I think I'm good to go. We'll, we'll see by the end of the show if you're <laughs> in a like a fever dream or something like that. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Previously, we ran through the greatest NHL player that wore the number that matched our episode number. We ran through all the numbers. So now we are looking at the almost greatest NHL player to wear each number from the runners up list in the hockey writers greatest NHL player to wear each number article. So the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 45 for the nominees in the Hockey Writers' Greatest NHL Player to Wear Each Number article and selected by me 
is Jonathan Bernay. Oh boy. Bernier. There we go. I had to phonetically spell this out. Bernier. All right. B E R N I E R. And I know it's a French name. I'm sure I'm going to get hammered on the French, but that, that's what I got. Bernier. There we go. There was no other nominee for runners up at number 45. So we had pretty slim pickings there. However, as a reminder, the greatest to wear number 45 was Aaron Ashen. And actually, Jonathan Bernier is not that bad. He had a really solid, solid. Career. Could you. Now, we haven't even had this conversation yet, but given that you're right, it is fairly in the history of NHL hockey. This is pretty slim pickings. Do you think the number 45 would be up there for the worst NHL number of all time? Oh, maybe. I'm sure that we're going to, we'll probably find some worse ones than that. Like, I always think, like, the 58s or, I don't know, like, just some random numbers where I can't even remember who the player was. But I'm sure we'll get – we'll have some slim pickings coming up. That's fun because we get to learn about guys we've never heard about. Yeah. All right, Josh. Jonathan Bernier. He's a goalie from Laval, Quebec. Bernier was selected 11th overall in the 2006 NHL entry draft by the Los Angeles Kings. Bernier played in 404 regular season NHL games over a 14-season NHL career. Bernier played his first five seasons in the NHL with the LA Kings. He then spent three seasons with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Next was a one-season stop with Anaheim, which was followed by a one-season stop with Colorado. He then spent the next three seasons with the Red Wings before ending his career with one season with the New Jersey Devils. All right, Josh, for his awards and accomplishments, he's a one-time Stanley Cup winner. Bernier won the Stanley Cup with the Kings in 2012, though he did not play during the Stanley Cup playoffs. And I think it's a travesty that there's not a website, or at least I could find, that says, hey, here's everyone's name that's engraved on the cup. You think that would be out there somewhere? Really? I couldn't. Yeah, because oh, wow. I wanted to know, because here's where this gets crazy, and this has happened a couple times. You go to Hockey Reference and look this guy up. It doesn't stay he won a Stanley Cup. You go to his NHL.com bio, and it's like one-time cup winner. And I'm like, okay, like how do I reconcile this? I I, I believe he would be considered a cup winner because he definitely I, – I looked at the rules, and it, it was like you have to play – or you have to be like half of the games as a backup or something. It was some weird thing for goalies. I can't remember exactly. But. Well, even like a guy like Phil Kessel like won the cup with Vegas, right? Yeah. Didn't he? I think so. Yeah, he won a cup without even playing. That was one of our yeah. – one of the things over why he's better than McDavid. Why he's better than McDavid. Yeah. But anyway, so that's what I'm going with. All right, for his career, 165 wins, 163 losses with 40 ties, 2.78 goals against average, 0.912 save percentage, and 18 shutouts. Bernier made the playoffs in three of his 14 NHL seasons, compiling two wins, five losses, with a 3.35 goals against average, a 0.885 save percentage, and no shutouts in nine NHL playoff games played. Boy, that's got to be depressing. 14 season career, you played nine NHL playoff games. Now, he was a backup, I think, for some. Well, no, I think when they made it, he was actually playing a lot. But, man, that's that's rough. <laughs> he seems like the perennial backup quarterback that has, like, this almost the perfect career where you yeah. play 10 years, you make decent money. I don't know what a uh, backup NFL quarterback makes way more than a backup NHL yeah. goalie. But probably like 500, 500 to 900,000 is what I would do. No guess. CTE. Your body doesn't take a beating. Your yep. knees still work. <laughs> and uh, you get to travel around and go to NHL games for yeah. so much. It's a good life. Best season of his NHL career. I'm going with this 2013-14 season with Toronto where Bernier had 26 wins, 19 losses, 7 ties, with a 2.70 goals against average, 0.922 save percentage, and 1 shutout. So a little quickly on Bernier, he was a hybrid stand-up butterfly-style goalie. He was excellent at controlling rebounds. Bernier kind of had this journeyman's career where he moved around a lot. But I'm just going to say this. It was a pretty successful career from a longevity standpoint. Anyway, you can survive in the NHL for 14 seasons as a goalie. Yeah. And in fact, when he was with Toronto for three seasons, he was their number one. He was the starter. So that's pretty good. I think you have a pretty good career. If you 14 seasons, 
and you uh, <laughs> kind of stuck around and made it worth your while. Well, I know too that the eras are different in hockey, especially when you look at goalie stats. It's really hard to compare. Yeah. But you look at his career, like a 2.78 goals against yeah. and a 0.912 save. That feels like all star numbers right now, doesn't it? It is pretty good. It's pretty good. And plus, it's not like he was he playing in the 80s or the 90s. He's sure. just recently. We'll get into that a little more. So that's kind of a little background. Bernier, actually, Josh, just retired in August of this year. He had a hip injury that required surgery and sidelined his career. And he hadn't played since December of 2021. However, he actually retired on August, I don't know, 21st of this year. Is when the press really he or he put the Instagram statement out. So that's kind of interesting. I want to show you something. So I found this picture when I was looking for him. And everyone on YouTube that's watching, you can see this. This was probably his last season. He's with New Jersey. But then he put his post on Instagram about retiring. I absolutely love this picture. Whoops. So see how it's like a combo of all the teams that he's that played cool. for. And it's the same photo that I found. They just photoshopped it and it's just i think it's just a super i'm sure it's not the first person to ever do this but i thought it's such a cool photo how it's got even on the stick like the or the blockers are different colors the pads yeah. i think it's just a, a great picture so i had to throw that in there all right for fun interesting facts we don't have a lot but at 19 years old bernier became the second youngest goalie and 11th youngest player to play for the king's when he started their season opener on September 29, 2007, Bernier made 26 saves in a 4-1 victory against the Anaheim Ducks, becoming the youngest Kings goalie to win his NHL debut. Second fun fact, on November 8, 2019, Bernier had two assists against the Boston Bruins to become the first Detroit goalie to do so since Jim Rutherford on February 18, 1979. You don't have too many games where a goalie gets a couple of assists, so... Had to bring throw no that one in there. What are the most right. points in a game is for a goalie? Did any goalie ever have three? Good question. I'm probably, I'm sure somewhere yeah. they did. I'll have to look that up. All right, his rookie card, Josh, 2007, Young Guns, number 223. If you're watching on YouTube, there's our sweet picture of it. PSA 10 has a pop of 45, gem rate of a paltry 69%. Last sales of this card were in 2022 that I could find in eBay, verified in therapy. And I kind of just listed down the last four sales that I could find in 2022. January 28th, there was one for $18.05 US. Then on June 26th, for $66 US dollars. June 17th of 2022, for $27.50 US. And then on November 15th of 2022, it sold for $20.50. So again, when I you see one of those jumps out, that sec or the June one is sixty-six dollars. And I was kind of looking at them and I'm wondering that one was in a new PSA holder. And oh. I wonder if that because those other like the original PSA holders or the older ones, I think maybe lose some of their uh, value because they look like they're easy to crack. I don't know, like the one you're seeing on here. I don't know if the new ones kind of hold more value, but that was the only difference I saw on it. So mm -hmm. maybe that was the reason why I went for more. But again, maybe his want, grandma was bidding with his. Yeah, no kidding. Or no kidding. But if you want this card and it's out there, it's cheap. All right, Troy. All right. Time for another edition of Rookie Deep Dive, where we take current NHL players that are at the top of the rookie leaderboard, present them as candidates to you, the watchers and listeners of our show, to vote on by an Instagram poll. And you guys vote to see who we should spend some time learning more about. Before we get into this week's candidates, though, we're going to quickly recap the 2023-24 Calder eligible rookies that we've covered so far. So in episode 80, we did Matthew Nyes, then Luke Hughes, Devin Levi, Matthew Coronado, Dustin Wolf, Ridley Gregg, Marco Rossi, Matthew Patois, Pavel Minchikov, Brant Clark, Brock Faber, and Luke Evangelista. So that brings us to this week, Troy, and we put four candidates up again. We have another goalie, Toronto's young goalie, Joseph Wool, Dmitry Voronkov, Connor Zare, who has shot up the rookie, rookie scoring leaderboard. Had to throw him on there. And then, of course, Bobby Brink. And we did a poll. We got the, the results are in. 
not shock Troy. A lot of interest in the Maple Leafs, of course, and the Joseph Wool, who uh, I believe might be hurt as of right now, but has been playing pretty well this year. Do we need to do a welfare check on Neil Troy, Irish Fires collector? Yeah, I don't know what's going on. He's a he had a nice campaign going in the Discord, had some posters made up, but no, nope, Bobby Brink once again second place. He's been stumping pretty hard for Bobby Brink, and I think. <laughs> Now, we haven't discussed this. This is like another on-air production meeting, but we'll probably, you know, sunset rookie deep dive for once we get through all the rookies, but then we'll bring yeah. it back next year. I just say we leave Bobby, even if it's like six years from now, <laughs> we leave Bobby Brink on rookie deep dive and see if see he ever me. gets voted <laughs> as the uh, the featured player. Yeah, I don't get it. So maybe someday, Neil, maybe someday. <laughs> but on to Joseph Wall. A very similar pose to the yep. Bernier, right? Uh, same yep. kind of what goalie stance or whatever. What is that called? He's, kind of he's sliding leg? into the RVH is what he looks like he's going to do. I call it Edward Scissor Legs, but I'm not a goalie <laughs> coach. So Joseph Woltroy is a 25 year old rookie goalie for your favorite Canadian team, the Montreal Maple Leafs. He's originally from, get this, he's from Dardane, Dardan. Prairie, Missouri. So there's two things that are really interesting. First, what, what is the universe doing to us? We finally got a guy from America, and he's from a town that has a French name. Yeah. That, of course, we can't pronounce. So <laughs> there we go. Second thing, Troy, an American goalie. That's kind there of pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, USA Hockey wants their whole, what was it, 51 and 30, which they wanted 51% of the minutes played in the NHL and whatever women's pro league to be played by U.S. goalies. I don't think that's going to happen. But yeah. Now, you are on the forefront of all things tendies with USA Hockey. Had, had you been aware of Joseph Wool or heard about him, followed him at all? I have not. The, I, the only thing I knew about him was the most rid- his ridiculous Young Guns picture. Like, there's not a guy, you'll get to it, but there's not a guy I've seen look more unlike his card than Joseph yeah. Wool. Yeah. Pretty sad. But we'll get to that. Now, he is 25 years old. So where does that fall in sort of the, is it still youngish for a rookie goalie? Or is that a little bit on the older side? Where do we feel about 25? Uh, I think it's still, you're still, I mean, that's usually when goalies start getting into the league. Okay. So it's, it's not, and it's just what it is now with goalies developing later. Funny thing too about his name, Wool, like it's W-O-L-L. I kind of feel like that's how they would say well where he's from in Missouri, right? That's like, it's like, like, well, Troy, it's about time we get an American uh, goalie up here in Toronto would be like, wool, Troy. It's about time we get, right? I mean, that's kind of how you would. Yeah, they have the southern draw in Missouri. Southern draw in there. Well, wool is a 6'4", 203 pound, about the prototypical measurements for today's NHL goalies. 62nd overall pick in the 2016 NHL entry draft, which is a third rounder. At the time of the draft, here's what here's what Dauber prospects had to say about Wool. I guess it was right after he was drafted. With the drafting of the young American goalkeeper, the Leafs inserted a talent that jumps to the top of the prospect depth chart in net. Wool possesses a large, projectable frame that is very attractive around the league that works well with his quick footwork. He has the same high-end potential that top goalie draftees Carter Hart and Philip Gustafson have, but Wool does not have the same type of hype due to the fact He's been playing in a more sheltered program more than a more so than a major junior league yet has been playing among some of the best talents around the U S development pro- program. So when they uh, say sheltered program, are they talking, they're talking about the U S development program or college? I think college. I think they're talking about, Bo- he played at Boston college. I mean, that's not like, Oh sheltered. yeah, but it would have been, if this was written when he was drafted, when he was drafted, he had to be in the U S uh, development program, right? He probably went he to college. Dra- yeah. And then he, and then he went to Boston college directly yeah. after that. Yeah, it's kind of funny just reading that. I I don't think it's considered sheltered anymore. <laughs> but if it was sure. about Boston College, it's like NCAA is catching up to major or to juniors, yeah. Junior and in big ways. Like there's a lot of stuff coming out on how it seems there's almost becoming a shift to send kids to the NCAA versus uh major juniors or whatever. We've got what Celebrini at He's either Boston U or Boston College. I can't remember. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, just wait until the SEC. There's talks about – there was on – was it Spit and Chicklets they were talking about? I think Bucci Grass was on talking yeah. about the SEC and 
maybe that they might go down the hockey rabbit hole. Who knows? That would be awesome. <laughs> so again, he was drafted in 2016, and then he's a rookie, and that's like yeah. seven years ago. So they're <laughs> like, well, what what have you been doing for the past seven yeah. years? So you're right. He was drafted right after a stint with the U.S. National Development Team in 2015-16. Then he proceeded to go to Boston College for three seasons. And right away, he slid into the starting goaltender role as a freshman because their previous starting goalie had just graduated, which was Thatcher Demko. That's pretty good. Yeah, so some big shoes to fill or big skates to fill. I don't know what the hockey analogy would be there. After posting a 2.64 goals against and 0.913 save percentage in his freshman season, he was named to the 2017 NCAA All Rookie Team Hockey East. Why does high? Why does NCAA hockey have? It's the only sport that has. You make like the all like your uh uh, uh well, what's it called the the high honor the all American, but it's like oh, by yeah. division. Well, why can't they just have an all American? Oh, I, they just need to be special. Got to make everyone feel good. After the 2019 college season, Wool signed a three-year entry-level contract with the Maple Leafs. Then he headed to Toronto's AHL affiliate, the Marlies, where he's really been trying for the last four seasons or so. Now, as a Maple Leaf fan, you're going to want to know this. So Mm -hmm. get a notepad, pen, take some notes here. Sorry, the Marlies are named, because I'm like, Marlies? Well, what the heck are Marlies? They're named after Toronto Marlboros. Which is the junior hockey team that was formerly sponsored by the Maple Leafs? Hmm. Now to keep sliding down the rabbit hole here, the Marlboros were named after the English noblemen, men plural, the Dukes of Marlboro. They're not named after cigarettes. Hmm. I, I, they don't have Marlboro in Canada, anyways, do they? Cigarettes, cowboy killers. I have no clue. <laughs> I think it's Parliament, right? Like that's like the uh, yeah. I don't know either, but uh, yeah. I just so there's your. Well, I hear that, and it's like that's immediately what I think of is cigarettes. No, yeah. as an American, it's like Marlboros, and it's like <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a weird name for a uh, like a triple A hockey team, fourteen year old kids or whatever. But yeah, yeah. Dukes of Marlboro. Not, not sure who they were, but <laughs> they've got a hockey team named after them. Wool's first season with the Marlies Troy was a little rough. He played thirty two games, finished with a three point seven five goals against and a point eight eight save percentage. Uh, apparently the Marlies were not a very good team that year though. So I don't know if he got a lot of help uh, along the way. He spent a good chunk of 2021, 22 injured playing only 15 AHL games, but, but did make his NHL debut that season ended up starting four games for the Leafs. Went three and one with a 2.76 goals against 0.911 save percentage. And then it was, I think it was last year where things really started to click for Wool in the Marlies, where his goals against improved to 2.37 and 0.927 save percentage in 21 games started. Last year, he also started seven games for the NHL team, going six and one with a 2.16 goals against and 0.932 save percentage. So, again, pretty strong campaigns in the AHL, as well as uh, with the short or handful of games with the Maple Leafs as well. So this summer, he, I think his waiver exemption expired and played well last year. So he earned the backup job out of camp to Ilya Samsonov and really kind of, I think, became a great opportunity for Wall Troy because Samsonov, I think, could be a, a unrestricted free agent at the end of this Ooh. year. So he's now in a position to earn that uh, starter's role for, for the Maple Leafs. So far, he's 8-5-1 and one in the season, 2.8 goes against. 0.916 save percentage. That he is leads... very, I was gonna say that's very Jonathan Bernier like numbers. Yeah, right very there. Jonathan Bernier numbers. <laughs> he leads all rookie goalies so far in save percentage and is third amongst goalies and goals against. Hmm. He does also have the most wins for a goalie so far with eight. Now, here's what kind of disappoints me about this kid. Just gotta be honest. I couldn't find a cool routine that he does. Ooh. Right, we have Devin Levi, the Jedi Master. We have the high jumping Dustin Wolf, and nothing from Wool. And I thought that was kind of a requirement now of every young goalie prospect is you have to have <laughs> this game stoppage kind of routine or pregame routine that gets the fans all juiced up. Yeah. Maybe does in the locker room. I did mention he's injured. He's currently out after suffering a high ankle sprain on December seventh. He was being helped off the ice by some teammates there. 
brutal injury, high ankle sprain for athletes. I, I don't feel like you see that a lot in hockey though, or with goalies. Is that common with goalies or no? No, goalies, it's mostly hips, groins. That's I mean, every once in a while you'll see a, a ankle or something, but usually, usually it's not. Usually it's hips and groins. So that's where all their weight lands. And that's usually groin pulls are big and hips eventually just fall apart. Now we'll get to the hockey card. Oh. He's a 2020 Young Guns, PSA 10 pop, 138, 37% gem rate, last over 108 US on December 17th, down about $8 or 7% in the past month. And it's down about the same amount since the start of the season, probably down a little bit because of the injury. He's another one of these COVID glamour shots, Troy. Like, like okay, brutal. look at this. Does that guy right there? Look like that guy, right? I mean, just his whole oh. body looks like a little skinny kid. I know goalies wear way oversized pads, but man, it doesn't it looks even like look his like... baby brother is like <laughs> put on his jersey or something like that, doesn't it? And I, I do love about this picture too his pad. If you're watching on YouTube, see how his pads like literally have like a 45 degree angle of his skates. <laughs> oh but, yeah, probably it's something that's to do how, with his injury. Well, kind of, but that's how goalie pads fit. They they're just they're not on. They're very tight. They rotate. They move, and sometimes they get off. When, the, when they're just not paying attention to it. But it's, I just, I can't stop looking at like this guy versus this big monster here, this guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's got a chance. He could be for a long time if he plays well, yep. the number one guy in Toronto. So there is your Joseph Wool rookie deep dive. All right. Got to make a quick mention for Gongshu sponsor Slab Sharks. Of course, we are super grateful to them for their support of our show. Now, they are on a bit of a hiatus, as we've talked about, from their very popular weekly auctions. But you can hardly tell, Troy, because <laughs> they do have an auction live that ends tonight, consisting of relistings and maybe cards that were submitted pre-holidays. And honestly, it's an awesome auction. I can't really tell the difference. There's a lot of cards and there's a lot of bangers. So go to slabsharks.com and check on the link to the auction. I don't know. Maybe people will be sleeping because it's the holidays and you might pick up some amazing cards. So don't forget to do that. And also remember that while they are on holiday break, they are still accepting submissions. So if you are a Canadian hockey cards collector and might be looking to cash out on a few cards, we'd strongly recommend checking out Slab Sharks for their eBay consignment services. They make it very easy to sell your cards on eBay because while well, they do all the work and then you don't have to. Which is pretty mm -hmm. awesome. Also, remember there's a 98% payout rate promo on all Connor Bedard cards through this upcoming June 2024. We're going to have to think about that, right? I, know. I keep thinking about shall not be mentioned. Yeah, I keep thinking about do we we pull it and just redeem the thing and just get it and just live live the right. just live the drama until it's actually announced. Even though everyone, well, it would be us. probably about another eighteen months of content because I that's know. probably what it will come. So check out slapsharks.com for complete consignment info, including payout rates, and to start the process of submitting cards as they ramp up their auctions for 2024 in early January. All right, Troy, hobby news. Hobby news. Well, I said last week, there's nothing going on. There's no yep. we drop. But now, of course, there is. Back. You speak it into the world, and the world speaks it back to you, I guess. Mm -hmm. We have more, kind of a baseball story, but we're going to tie her into hockey, like we always do. We have more tops, fanatics, or Bauman, Bowman, whatever you say. Uh, 101 hobby drama, Troy. Again, we're seeing duplicate 101s on social media <laughs> and for sale on secondary markets. A good number, something like 12% of the newly released Super Factors, I think from Bowman Draft, showed up on eBay from one seller's account just a few days after the release, too. Yeah, well, that doesn't hot. look suspicious at yeah, all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. The products went up for three days. I have 12% of the 101s. <laughs> But it's totally organic. I just opened <laughs> up a, a few cases. So apparently, Troy, because the the president of Fanatics Collectibles came out and said that these cards were stolen from the factory and they were incomplete, did not pass production quality standards, and should have been discarded. So not discarded. Discard they should have been destroyed. Is what it right. should say. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I use the word discarded. Maybe he did. Oh use man. The okay. Word I just was like. Like even if they, if they use the word discarded, that just shows how inept they are at this whole thing right now. So the result, of course, is there's now multiple one ones out there mm -hmm. from that Bowman draft release. And 
I just gave the shorthand version. Check out a guy like Coach Co, like his TikTok, if you want more in-depth in- info. Again, we're a hockey cards podcast. But here's why I wanted to bring up the baseball card story. So first of all, we've been following fanatics and kind of how they are navigating through their initial year into the hobby and some of the changes they're making. At this point, though, you have to say that they're having a lot of one-on-one issues, like almost every release. It's like they can't seem to get the one-on-one thing right. And I don't know, maybe it's bad luck or they're trying to like implement these big changes that and there's growing pains or uh, something's going on. But holy bananas, they cannot seem to get any of these big products out without having all these, you know, they're paying $100,000 for duplicate one-on-ones. It's just crazy, Troy. I don't know. The other reason, though, why I wanted to talk about this, and, and here's how it relates to the hockey hobby, is when you say that these cards were stolen out of the factory, I, I just have to wonder if these companies like Tops or Panini, and then, of course, Upper Deck, if they, what's the production facility security I know. like? I know. Because if you think about it, right, these are some of these cards are like lottery tickets, like the 101 yes. Bedard Young Guns. Who knows? what that card's going to be worth. And are you just letting that float around the factory for some like hourly workers that, and you don't know if they started yesterday and just came there to steal the Bedard or it's, it's like, I kind of feel like these cards are getting so valuable that they almost need to pre production, like, like a lottery would. Yeah. And be like a highly secure environment and have all these safety protocols. Cause I just don't think that you can, that it's going to fly much longer for a company like Fanatics Troy to say, oh, they were just like, whatever the reason is today, why the, these are, you know, is that at some point you got to lock this stuff down, right? Don't you? You have to. I don't know how they do it. I also think this just opens up more and more to, we haven't seen it yet, but we've heard talks, governments, regulation coming in and just say, hey, we want to kind of take a look at things because the more this stuff goes on and I just, I can't, I mean, I can't understand if you have this deal with your distributors, let's say it's upper deck, right? In Italy. And you're, you're, I don't know if they're putting people there or they're just, they sign some agreements. They go do their audits. They say, okay, this looks good. I mean, I would love to see one of these companies produce a video on all the security checks, but you know, that will never happen, but it's just, well, it's one of those interesting things that just keep happening. And Fanatics better figure it out because I don't know how many more releases you can have of duplicate one ones And I was thinking too, do you think for every one one there's two actually produced? Oh, I don't in, know. In case one gets damaged and then they always have a backup and then... But, but we've seen some of the one ones and it's like yeah. they're not all of these in great shape. So yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Have you ever seen, I think it's like a Netflix documentary on the McDonald's mon- Monopoly game. Oh, yeah. That was all rigged. That was, yeah. It was all rigged. Well, and it wasn't rigged by McDonald's. It was nope. rigged by the, the company that they contracted to print them. That there was like, I was so long ago, so I'm like paraphrasing or speaking off the what little I remember. But it was a, like a factory supervisor that was taking all the top yep. prizes and then re- having relatives like redeem yep. them. Yep, relatives and friends he was giving them to. And they would and, win them. And so basically the whole run of McDonald's Monopoly, yep. nobody ever won anything good because this yep. guy took took it all. And again, that, that's why like, and I think that that's somewhat analogous to these printing facilities where they make these cards. And so hopefully Upper Deck is paying attention. Now, they may already have a super lockdown, secure and safe process. I don't know. I'm not accusing well, them of anything, of course, yeah. but. Yeah, you think that there's got to be. I want people with guns there. <laughs> Hold, holding it down. Yeah, I'm curious. I mean, it's very, very intriguing. But, boy, this makes me really want, really wish that I owned my own printing. Does, Fanat- does Fanatics own their own printing facility? I thought they bought one. Or there was well, been, I, What I, at least, I think this is what I think I know, is that Part of the reason why Upper Deck is in Italy is Fanatics went as they would like to control stuff. Yeah. Went up and bought a lot of the printing facilities, so maybe that removed some availability for Upper Deck in the United States. Okay, but I don't know. That might not be 100 percent accurate. So yeah. It's just... Well, figure it out. Figure it out, bud. 
All right, moving along, Troy. Uh, Jack Hughes, ever hear of him? I have. He scored his 100th goal. <laughs> is him scoring his 100th point? <laughs> no, his 100th I just, goal? Sometimes I just find the most ridiculous <laughs> photo, and it's like, how do you not show this on this show? <laughs> They gotta make a card out of this. Wouldn't this be like a great young guy? Oh, game? this is a great uh canvas card. Yeah. Uh, so the 22-year-old Devil's Phenom scored his 100th goal as part of a hat trick he scored against the Blue Jackets on December 16th. Uh, of course, very big milestone for a young star. Which I look at the, the pictures and laughing again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what my favorite part is? Well, there's two favorite parts. Three. There's <laughs> three. Number one, the positioning is a little suggestive. Yeah, we'll go with that. Then the fact that his helmet's crooked, that is the yeah. best part of the photo. And then he's missing his tooth. Yeah, his, his tooth. smile in, in the other one. But okay, so 22 years old, scores 100 goals. Pretty big milestone, right? Yeah. Got me thinking, Troy, about the fastest players, to, or the players who got to 100 goals the fastest. And this list kind of blew my mind. So it... I think it was something. Oh, geez, and I didn't even write it down. I think it's something like, maybe you can find a quick one. I'm talking Fair. like yeah. almost 300 games or like 260 games for Jack Hughes. I think it's one less than the current games he's played in his career because yeah, it's gonna be like game. 268 or something. 268 games, right? To get to 100 goals, Mike Bossy did in 129 games. I'm telling you, I Bossy to me still will be the greatest what if ever, man. That guy. If his knee or his back, knees, whatever it was, could have held out, he was unbelievable for goal scoring. And Solani, obviously, what, 70, was it 76 his rookie well, season? He was, a, he was, a, he was, a, Solani got to 100 goals in 134 games. Yeah. Took him five more games than Bossy and the Gretzky at 145 games. I just think going back to this Bossy number, how ridiculous that is. <laughs> 100 goals in 129 games. Yep. Imagine now in the, the trading card era, if a rookie comes out, Oh, next year and scores a hundred goal in his first hundred twenty nine games. Yeah, the hobby would lose its mind, right? Just crazy. It will so be again, like when, it will be like when Bedard scores four goals in a game this year. <laughs> if if that more of an assist guy lately, but I know another story, another day. Again, very cool milestone for the very young Jack Hughes. And Jack Hughes is a 2019 Young Guns, as we all know. PSA 10 pop 4,271, 75% gem rate, last sold for 276 US dollars on December 18th. It's down about 11% in the past month and about, but still up 6% in the past three months. I refuse, okay, to, some... show, I, I refuse to show it because this is the new Young Guns. This is <laughs> <laughs> it is the great. If you're even listening, go back later just to see this photo on our YouTube. You won't, you won't be sad. You did it. Okay, I have some quick news and notes. Maybe the first one won't be a little. There might be some discussion around this, but a lot of hubbub around the Minnesota Wild game earlier this week back in Pittsburgh, uh -huh. where Flower, of course, Mark Andre Fleury making his return to Pittsburgh in what some people think could have been his last game ever in Pittsburgh, and the fans got really into it. For and I noticed this even before the stories came out while I was watching the game. The we want Fleury chance throughout uh they were pretty vocal and the whole crowd mm -hmm. was getting into it um so i wonder Troy, if, if they were chanting we want flurry because they love flowers so much or were they worried about the <laughs> heater or the gus bus is on i was just thinking about that they probably just didn't want gus bus because he's been on he's, he's a who's hot candidate i'm assuming most weekly now so of course as i said many thought it could be his last game in pittsburgh and so fans are hoping to see him play again now and two, the other thing that's kind of interesting about the story is that in the normal goalie rotation, the new wild coach, John Hines, had scheduled Flurry to play the next night, which I think was in Boston on a back to back. So you think, well, geez, play him in Pittsburgh if he's going to play that game. But then you saw in, in a couple of interesting things afterwards that Flurry mentioned in interviews. The first thing was is that he w maybe put the brakes a little bit on the retirement momentum. Yep. And I think intimated a little bit that he is leaning, I think, at this point to play next year. So it maybe won't be his last game in Pittsburgh. And then he went on and was pretty vocal about really not liking to play in Pittsburgh and yep. was actually happy he didn't play. And I think because he probably has such fond memories there yeah. and just kind of being awkward. And I guess I understand that. Do you? Yeah, I get it. I think at the end of the day, once Flurry talked, it was much ado about nothing. 
there was a lot of like Twitter stuff. Oh, I'll play Flurry. What's Hines doing? He's the new Babcock. And it's like, no, this is <laughs> this is kind of driven by Flurry. This is what he wants to do. So just deal with it. And I, I really think he's coming back. I don't know. I don't know if he signed with us again or if he's a free agent, but it sounds like he wants to play another year. So I it can't be with us because at some point you have to let oh, we get yeah, 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 we we need wall stand up here. And, and and honestly, I think between last year and this year, Gus has earned the number one goalie job. Don't you think? Maybe he'll be the goalie coach for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you see, too, he's up to his normal, like, in the NHL yeah. player loves us, the cute flower antics where he yep. went in the dressing room and he gave, he put the white helmet in Chris Latane's locker. Ha, ha, ha. Funny, funny, funny. But he's smart. I mean, he knows how to play the system that way. Well, I don't get the whole... The whole that the helmet thing is kind of funny, but it's like they're like, oh, Latang was going to go out with it until the equipment manager said you get fined. And how do you not realize the helmet's white that you're putting on your head? Like, I just don't understand don't this. It just seems weird. All right. In other news, the Ottawa Senators, and we have some big Senators fans in our Discord, so we hear a yeah. lot about it, have relieved head coach DJ Smith of his duties. Jacques Martin, who was hired as a senior advisor on December 6th, will replace him on an interim basis. When you're a head coach, and your team's struggling, and they hire a senior <laughs> advisor. It's a, a now, pretty good sign. You might be want to. Was talk this a senior realtor advisor? About yeah, was this senior advisor Brady Kachuk's <laughs> junior yeah. coach or something? <laughs> um, also kind of interesting is that in addition to naming Jack Martin the interim head coach, they also brought on Daniel Alfredson, who is a Senators legend, as an assistant coach. So kind of interesting mm-hmm. there. The team was 11, 15, and 0 at the time of Smith's firing have been pretty disappointing this year. It's kind of funny when you think of like teams on the rise that you thought, oh, maybe this would be the year for you look at maybe the maybe not so much the Blue Jackets, but definitely the Sabres and Senators. You thought one of those teams would be good, but yeah, both been terrible. Senators have not made the playoffs since 2017, Troy. It also seems like a long time coming for the yeah. Senators fans that we have in our life. Uh, they've been complaining about this DJ Smith guy. For well, they were, they were jealous. They were jealous when we fired uh, Evanson because they're like, oh, I wish that would happen in <laughs> Ottawa. Yeah. Talk about a cutthroat business, too. So we're, what, two months, three months in the season, something like that? Well, October, November, well, two and a half months. Already four coaches. And that's not even including the whole Babcock mess. Yeah, that dude. yeah, Jay Woodcroft in, the, in Edmonton. Dean Evison, of course, our coach with the Wild. Craig Berube was just let go for St. Louis. And now DJ Smith. Um, short leash, I guess, if you're a coach these days. Eh? Yeah, I was looking up. I was trying to find him while we were talking. Who was the longest tenured? I think it's John Cooper right now is the longest tenured. And then maybe Sullivan in Pittsburgh. And there's rumblings about him now and a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. All right, last story in hobby news. Got to mention the OV goals drought. It's uh, 13 games now, Troy, without a goal. The longest number of consecutive games without a goal in, in his career. He's sitting at five goals after 28 games. Up there. Uh, all right. Easter we'll, egg. You explain your, we'll let you explain your, draft, your graphic e- here. Easter egg for our people watching on YouTube. There was a graphic put out by NHL Breakers. That's a picture of Ovi says zero goals in the last month. And then a picture of Tristan Jari that says one goal or should say one goal in the last month. I just thought this was funny. It's mean, but it's funny. So Ovi's pacing for 15 goals on the season. Of course, hardly what anyone had expected. You had sent me, though, a good article that was written a couple days ago from The Athletic yeah. by Shana Goldman. Because you talked it into existence. You're like, I need to start digging into what's going on. And there's literally... Eight hours later, this article appeared on The Athletic. And she did a good job of, I assume it's a she, right? Yeah, yeah, she's awesome. She's really good. Breaking down what's behind Ovi's lack of goals production. And after reading the article, which I would recommend to anyone that has an athletic subscription, I think the article is a little bit more positive about his prognosis, his goal scoring prognosis, than, than negative. It seems like his scoring chances are actually up a little bit over last year. The the issue is his shooting percentage is yeah. like two percent, where he's been like a fifteen yeah. percent guy in the past. And I think her hypothesis was that only like they looked at like all like the advanced analytics, right? Like the high danger chances and blah 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 blah. 
um and that that has to normalize a little bit like he can't be shooting as much as he is have as many high danger chances and not eventually score goals the the one thing i thought that was interesting though and i, I really want to get your input on this as a active hockey coach is that it did talk a little bit about how the game is changing where these like big wind up slap shots and one timers are that that the defenses are so fast now there's no yep. time to do them and where he's kind of made a career out of it and you you don't and i and you know after i read that i, I was sitting there thinking you don't see as many nope. like big slap shots anymore it's all more like snapshots and wrist and wristers like connor bedard is like all wrist shot right? yeah it's totally analytics it's quickness it's time to get a shot off the longer you wind up the more time a goalie has to set up and if you know every time we look at the advanced analytics the Royal road right down the middle of the rink. If you can get the goalie to move across that you're, you're exponentially going to increase your rate of scoring. And however, you need to get the shot off quick at once it passes that Royal road and not wind up slap shots are dying. I think they'll eventually be gone. You'll see them every once in a while, but it's we're seeing it in every level of hockey. It's now snap. It's just quickness. Snapshot wrist shots are leading the way. What were your takeaways from the article? I just was curious, like I, I didn't know the shooting percentage thing. And I am also one of those believers, like law of averages, like stuff. <laughs> it's like he has the worst puck luck ever right now with his shot and everything. And there's a, I can't remember if she got into this. Here's a stat called PDO and it's basically shooting percentage plus save percentage, but that has to equal hundred percent. And if you're above it, you should regress. And if you're below it, you should move up and he should move up at some point. He's got to start scoring. <laughs> Now, I was working on this story a day or so ago, and I was about, we did this little goal tracker for over here graphic. I was about to make one for our guy Kaprizov, but then he had an epiphany and decided <laughs> to learn how to score goals last night and not to hijack this into a wild story, but <laughs> I haven't even gone a while. I saw on Twitter he did his first live post game interview last night, as now in he English. Probably, yeah, he probably speaks oh. English better than we speak French. Yeah, he probably does. So. But again, though, getting back to Ovi, it just feels like he hasn't scored a goal in forever. And yeah. I, I just hope his next goal isn't an empty netter, because I think two of his five are. Two of his five like are empty netters this year. Ovi is a 2005 Young Guns PSA 10 pop 1,186. 38% gem rate last sold for $3,972 on December 18th. Up about 2% in the past month, but down 11% in the past three months. And again, it's just funny like how you compare hype. Like He can't score a goal. And his young guns up two percent. And <laughs> who are the guys who were like Jack Eichel and who else that we were oh. been talking about recently who have like literally set the world on fire and they're down like thirty. Was it Kucherov? I, I don't know if it was Kucherov. Was. Like okay, Troy. Huge day in the hockey hobby. The cup is out. Kind of a Christmas present, I guess, to the hobby. I'm not sure if it's ever really come out this close to Christmas, but mm. very fun day. Happens once a year or less, or maybe twice. <laughs> Who knows when the cup comes out? It just comes out when it comes out now. But again, 2021, 22, the cup came out today. We were thrilled to have the opportunity to chat on a very busy day with Billy Celio, who, of course, is a product manager at Upper Deck. He's the product manager for the cup to learn more about the product. So we're going to roll our conversation with Billy now. All right, we're excited to welcome back Billy Celio to the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. A, a big day in the hockey card hobby. Maybe the biggest day of the year, right, Billy? Where we have, it's the cup is out. The biggest day in 1992, or 1990, or 2002, 2022, whatever. Yeah. 2023. Um, I'm, I'm already, I'm getting the year so mixed up because it's 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 a little late. But yeah, we're we're really excited. We finally got this out. Um, it's been sitting there for a while and, uh, yeah, the cup, you guys have been waiting for those call Cole Caulfields and I've been waiting for the ciders and the Raymond. So, um, you know, I've, I've been seeing a lot of action so far today and I'm really excited to finally see it out in the public. Now I know that it's technically late, but it's actually how many months since the last cup came out, maybe eight months. Something I think like that, or? honestly, I think we only beat it by about a month. I think it's been 11 months. Like, I think we were like, dude, we were here because we, we fly out to North Carolina and, and hand pack this. And we were like, I think we were a month earlier than what we were last time. So okay. 
I don't, we don't plan on that being the case. Like you're not going to, it's not going to be another 11 months. I, th I think we're going to try to get this thing out a little bit faster for 22, 23. Like our goal is still to catch up and, and this is just a tough one to catch up on. It's, it's uh, you know, a lot of hard signed uh, cards in there, a lot of technology um, and, I, and a lot of the laminated cards. When I say laminated cards, it's easier to print like 20 point cards, but when you have to print hundred to 140 point cards, um, it takes more time. And so, um, and cutting all the memorabilia and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, it, it takes a little bit of time and we're trying to get it out, you know, faster and catch up even more. You know, you can see some of our, uh, 20, uh, 23, 24 products are starting to come out and they're coming out earlier than, than they did last year. So, you know, we're still, we're still catching up, but I think we're getting there. I know that we talked a little bit earlier before we start recording. There's some holiday festivities going on around the office there at Upper Deck. But I am curious, though, is there a, like a buzz in the office on cup release day? Is there any sort of difference or anything like that? <laughs> so we get we get a, a QA case and uh, we got ours. Uh, I think it was yesterday. And usually I'll set up a meeting and we'll all get together and open it up and, you know, it'll look all nice. Well, <laughs> um grant and i couldn't wait and i think we ripped four of the six tins like with nobody there so uh, uh we we showed tony a little bit of, of, of tony came in and, and saw some of the cards too but uh yeah we we were a little anxious for it um i'll, I'll let the other guys uh bust open the other two tins that we have left but um yeah it's it's obviously a big deal we're obviously very excited about it these are these are some nice cards and one thing i will say is you know you build the cup each year and um it's tough to build a set where you haven't seen the last two years of it so you yeah. know i'm gonna i'm gonna start building 24 25 probably uh you know in a few months and uh it's it's difficult to like okay what inserts worked what didn't um and you know, is should I bring back chemical composition? I'm only joking. Um, yeah, my the worst <laughs> insert I've ever made ever. Like I, the fire people was better than that one. It just didn't get executed. <laughs> but um, and it was, what was sad is I saw some past. Cup, there's two. There's two subjects that do have those cards as past product in the cup. And I, yeah, every time I saw one, I was like, oh, but they're not horrible. Um, anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of excitement. I, I went off on a tangent there. Sorry. Uh, I have a really quick cup opening question. So it's a box, but then it's really a tin and you open the tin and then there's a little box and inside that little box is the cards, but they're wrapped very tightly around like styrofoam to keep them protect like a foam border. What What's the proper way to remove the cards from the foam? Is it to push the cards through? Is it to tear the foam on the edge? and remove it that way so i found uh the wine bottle technique works the best where you just kind of put a cork through it and then pull it no um <laughs> honestly i usually i usually hold the cards down and pull and uh okay. that seems to have worked on the last uh the couple tins i i opened up yesterday um and uh i I mean, people can do it their own way i've seen people where they rip every edge of the box first and then uh, like they they're not like pulling to try to get the thing um there, there's to each their own like people sure. open i still use my teeth to open packs so uh you know people can open their stuff however they want to open it yeah another kind of general question but you've worked on the cup how many years now so um it, it's you know, 15, 16 was the first year that I, I kind of took the reins. And I say that, but, um, you know, Grant, those first couple of years was really, you know, kind of showing me the ropes. And I have a feeling he had a lot to do with it. This is one of my favorite photos and uh, that I took my first cut pack out. And I've, I've shown this to some people, but uh, it's it's pretty amazing. And I'll try to zoom it in so you can see. So this is Grant at the pack cut pack out what you can't really see is those cards there's 99 of them those are all the connor mcdavid rookie auto patches wow he's sitting there yeah so just imagine how much he's 
he's sitting how much money he's sitting in front of right there with all those cards so yeah grant grant was a huge influence uh and director when it came to me building those first couple sets of the cup um i've and he still gives feedback every i every one of my builds i still go through grant and he still gives me feedback and still you know he still has his uh his influence on everything he helps with uh you know approving designs myself and him are usually you know ones that they ask approvals for so um how i snuck chemical composition past them i still don't know to this day but uh i'm going to bring bring that insert up like 20 times sorry uh, <laughs> but uh no um so i started really working on it in 15 16 no pressure okay. you know mcdavid's rookie year but uh you know it took a couple years for me to really be the guy that you know comes up with the outline of the sets you know we have designers that design the cards we have coordinators that make the checklists you know we have a bunch of other people that are that are huge like for our photo department you know a bunch of people are involved in building the sets i just build the outline and kind of come up with some concepts and they we have a top-notch staff that turns what i what i give them into some beautiful cards mm -hmm. You work on a lot of products and and have worked on the cup for a while now, you said, so in part, at least since 2015. What's unique about building the cup versus any other set you work on? The cup, it seems like there's less rules. And when I what I mean by that is it's just like, hey, I want to do a card that has two or three, pa three, two or three different colors of deco foil. Well, that costs money. And so, but I, it's going to make the card look really nice. Something like the NHL collection or the basics. Uh, the NHL collection has two different colors of deco foil. That means two different dyes that get stamped on the card. And then the, the basics actually has three different colors of deco foil. So three different dyes, which makes it really unique. So just stuff like that or booklet cards. Booklet cards are not cheap to make, and this is really the the time that I can that I can make booklet cards. Stuff like the monumental patches and the printing plate booklets, uh, things like that. You know, the cup allows you to kind of you know the cost per card to make the card is a little is is higher than in many of our other sets, um, and so. I don't want to say there's no rules. There are definitely rules, but we made cards that have like 0.999% silver, you know, uh, yeah. in the cup before. So, you know, there's, there's not many rules. There are some, but there's not many rules. You, you, you get a free reign to kind of come up with some ideas for sure. You're just not as budget constrained as you are probably in a flagship release, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, you're still only building a certain number of, of, uh, of tins and uh you know so you can't just shoot for the moon on every single card but that being said you're still given the opportunity to do some cool stuff mm -hmm. okay so you said you opened the cup yesterday and we're talking about the 2021 22 release which is out today of course what stood out to you when you were opening the the packs you know um there's a there's a few inserts on there that just look really nice um one of the things i really enjoyed and some people are like aren't these show cards supposed to be signed and stuff and we added the show as a just a non-auto insert and those cards i just i love the look of the show cards and so signed or unsigned i think that's a uh, improvement on on some unsigned uh inserts that maybe we've done in the past so something like that i i really enjoyed um and then like the enshrinements look like the a lot of the stuff with the acetate on it the ptg um really came out nice um i think we went back to more of a classic looking style of the cup we didn't get too crazy we didn't uh you know come up with too many wild concepts we kind of really went back to the roots of of some of these uh inserts now we've tweaked some of the the, the you know we tweaked some of the uh the inserts and and how they are and what they what they do, but you know, I, I think we really went back to the bread and butter of what makes the cup the cup. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have the show up on the screen for people that are watching on YouTube, and I've seen a few of these cards today too. There's a white and a black version for yep. each player, correct? Not not can, necessarily. Can you kind of explain the concept? Not necessary for each player. Um, like there might be some guys on on the the white background checklist 
that aren't in the black background checklist. Like I gave my coordinator free reigns to kind of do whatever, depending on how many autographs they have. But we have a UDA piece called the show. And we've put these cards into um, into the cup before where it's kind of like a shadow box feel. I didn't want to do the shadow box. I wanted like I just wanted the look of the card. And so um, the, the version that we're looking at here is the white version. It's, it's a full body. It's usually a full body action image for the white version. And they sign it. And then the, uh, the black background version is actually more of like a waist up uh, image of the player. And they sign either in a silver or gold pen uh, for those cards. So uh, it's the same insert, but they look different. Uh, if mm -hmm. if that makes sense and I, I just the design themselves I, I i've loved them for uda we usually have a few of these hanging up in the office and they're some of the nicest pieces that we have hanging up so a number of years back we said let's turn these into cards and we did that for the cup and they looked nice and uh, i just wanted to take the shadow box as aspect out of it and just give them a nice 140 point card okay what else stood out to you? Were you pleased with the general, just I guess how everything came out from the base card design to the RPA and all that stuff? Would it kind of match your concept? Yeah, and and as I, I was as I said, I was in North Carolina, so I actually, you know, if I see a good pack on on YouTube or on breaks and stuff, I'm going to tell people I packed that one. But uh, you know, we had about six or seven guys that uh, some people in North Carolina, a couple of us flew out from from California. And so I've, I've seen a lot of the cards. I'm the guy that took the pictures of all the stuff that's in our Facebook uh, uh, groups. You know, I constantly just looking for some stuff and, you know, there's some really cool, nice looking cards. I just, I think the cards look great. Um, I don't think you'll see too many people complain that the cards and the designs look bad. Um, so I, I'm excited about that. Um, and uh there's a lot of there's a lot of good rookies in this in this class. That's the one thing that you got to be worried about is if it's so old, like, you know, sometimes these rookie cards will get a lot of value because it's still an unknown for some of these guys. Well, obviously, it's two years later. You know, you know what type of player Cole Caulfield is. You know what type of player Zegers and Cider is. I'll tell you a nice surprise. See you, Grant. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a nice surprise. Someone like Quentin Byfield, who after the yeah. first couple seasons, people are like, oh, this guy just isn't going to cut it. Like they wasted a number two pick on uh, on this guy. And man, he's he's close to a point of game right now. You know, he's playing well. You got Jeremy Swayman uh, in there doing real well, too. You know, there's a lot of there's a the rookie class has has stood stood well. And so that was that was one of the the biggest uh you know, satisfaction was the fact that we weren't too worried about the rookies having lost all their value. Yeah. Well, and that like, and that, that that's out of your control though, right? Like, you know, next year, as of right now, it looks like that next year's release could be a little bit of a challenge because the cop guys aren't playing so well, but then I guess maybe the benefit there is, you know, that'll probably still come out about a year or so from now. And who knows? We'll have, maybe we'll have like a Quentin Byfield type resurgence. By the exactly. Uh, one of the cards that I wanted to talk about was the the printing plates, and in particular, I really think that you guys have emphasized kind of jazzing those up a little bit, if that's maybe the right way to put it. But but not just showing the printed plate, but maybe like embedding it into a thicker card, putting a patch around it putting autos on them and it just seems like that you're evolving the way that you're you know trying to make the printing plates maybe a little more interesting is that a good way to put it yeah so a few years ago you know i started making entertainment products and and printing plates um you know they're a big deal in entertainment still you know in in marvel licensed stuff you know people still love printing plates and in sports if you haven't noticed the they've kind of been slipping a little bit when it comes to you know their value they, they don't get the the value that they should for being a one of one card that the that all these other cards were made from so you know we we just we wanted to kind of jazz it up a little bit like do i want to put four printing plates in in flagship uh of the cards that were in there yes that definitely took a little bit of hit from from our flagship products but 
what we did with them by making like printing plate booklets a few years ago, I think was a was a huge uh, positive step for, you know, hits in the cup. You got all four of them. I, I joked uh, somewhere else, like some guy, when Chris Carlin was here, he sent me a tweet that said, buy this guy a beer for for finally putting all the four printing plates on, on one card. And, uh, you know, I was hoping it might be a nice IPA or something like that, but uh, no, no such luck. But anyway, um, and then the, uh, the year before, um, you know, I was just kind of sitting there thinking, I'm like, well, do we ever use the back of the printing plates, the back plates? And they're like, no. And I'm like, I can't remember seeing a, a back mm -hmm. plate. And I was like, well, let's, let's do a dual sided printing plate book, uh, card where, you know, you got the front and then you got the back and heck while we're at it, throw, throw the patch. If it's, if we're, if we're taking the printing plates from the auto patch cards, why don't we make those auto patch cards also? And that's what they've done. And, uh, man, our, our, uh, our equipment cutting team has definitely, uh, stepped their game up on, on making sure that the, the patches in those cards are, uh, are amazing. Um, I remember, I think one of them has like the little Eagle head for, uh, Ovechkin or something like they, they, they did a great job. So, yeah, we didn't just want to put a printing plate in there. We wanted to, you know, make it look nice, make it collectible again, because printing plates used to be a big deal and, and they've kind of uh, slowed down in the past few years. It kind of makes me wonder, too. It's like the I'm kind of wondering, like the, the, the process a little bit and if it's like a chicken or egg. So, like, let's say that but you just mentioned, like, you have an OV, like amazing Eagles head patch, right? how does that card or how do some of these cards come to be where is it, is it you say, I want to have a, an OV with an insane patch, go find an insane patch or, or you guys kind of let know what you have like an in inventory as far as memorabilia and you're able to design cards around that. So our, our memorabilia team, um, you know, our, our coordinators will allocate memorabilia to our team in North Carolina who does all the cutting of the memorabilia and um through you know some of them have been there a while and they and they know what to expect but if they don't know what to expect um you know we write briefs about for each product and something like the cup i will give specific directions that say please use like limited logos please use uh you know this specific patch from the jersey uh for other things maybe use the use the uh letters on the back or you know that sort of thing we we give specific directions on what part of the patch they or what like patch they should use from a jersey and then for something like that we might even specifically say please make sure that you know the patch is the best of the best in this and so they'll sit there and they have these directions beforehand and they'll line it up with their little like grid cutter thing and they'll make sure they position that one that one one of there's pat the 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 great back there what was his name again Party time, Pat. Party time, Pat. Yeah, he just walked past <laughs> us. Um, so uh, you know, we we um, they'll line up that one patch. Party time, Pat. Say hi. There he is. Yep. There he is. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much how it's set up. Is we do give direction, and if we say make it like the best patch available, they they know what we're talking about. They know what to look for. And and I know like as a, as I've learned from you over time now as a product manager you kind of come up with the overall creative brief creative direction the you're sort of the architect of the set and then you have a coordinator that works on the checklist but careful when it careful comes... saying the word the architect careful okay. careful with the architect oh okay. <laughs> I think I understand um, but when it comes to one set in particular and that's the the rookie checklist and who's the who gets the out of 99 treatment versus who gets the out of 249 treatment? How, how is that decided? We have a guy that's uh, his job title is the vice president of product development. And uh, he usually will, um, he will approve what our coordinator uh, decides as the 99s. So okay. um, he has the final say it's grant. Um, yeah. He has the final say of who the 99s are, and the the thing that's uh, that it's I don't want to say it sucks, but you know these these checklists and stuff have to be made at a specific time. So, 
you know, uh, last year, someone like uh, Jason Robertson, you know, was a 249, which definitely yeah. helped <laughs> for like for uh, 10 hits for sure. But, uh, you know, with the numbers that he put up, he definitely probably deserved to be a 99, but he didn't come on until, you know, later on. So, um, yeah, but Grant, is there a harder fast rule around like how many, what number of players you can have on that check? I I know something like, I know, um, in ice, I know we changed it from six to 10 that are 99s for ice premieres, but we're not, we're not stepping away from, uh, six 99s. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I, I have another, one more question too, along the theme of kind of how these concepts get done. And one of the most interesting cards to me in this release is this one right here. I was glad that you guys posted it to your Facebook. It's the signature renditions combos. Wayne Gretzky and Steve Eiserman from uh, 1997 when they played in the all-star game together. How does a card like this come, come about? Cause it's like, it obviously takes the coordination cause it's hard signed to get both Wayne and Eiserman to sign the card. Well, so, I obviously give the coordinator direction to put as many Red Wings in as possible and sometimes sprinkle them in with some other players that wish they were Red Wings. Um, No, they, uh, you know, we have in the checklist, it's it's signature rendition combos and our coordinator. I, I think this is one of the fun, the inserts they actually enjoy is trying to find figure out combos going through images that they can use but uh you know it's it's easier to get combos of legends because they're usually at home and we send them the stuff and they sign it as opposed to players who are flying all over the place and uh you know their addresses change every every few weeks sure so um you know you'll see a lot probably see a lot more signature rendition combos of of legends but that being said it's our coordinator that you know gets to come up with unique uh unique concepts and the toughest part for them is making sure they don't redo something that's been done before because we've been doing this insert probably for about seven or eight years as long as i can remember um so yeah i i love this card um you know i i tell people that uh i love the blue paint pens on the signature renditions because they can basically cut through every single uh, color. This is the only card I've ever seen that maybe it doesn't uh, cut through as well as it should, but it's still a beautiful card. Any dual side Wayne Gretzky, Steve Eiserman card, I'll take that in a heartbeat. Yeah, very, very unique. And the signature renditions have sort of like a painting look to them. Yep. Um, it's, it's, uh, they're digitally in like, yeah enhanced and stuff this is from an actual picture that they they turn and then we kind of just have a little fun with the background um to kind of make it look artsy gotcha so i was just listening to a podcast with gretzky i think Joe buck was interviewing him you know the detroit thing with him right and gretzky oh yeah that's what i was saying guys that wish they played for detroit oh yeah yeah there we go almost a red wing but his uh, dad talked him out of it yeah i was gonna say thanks dad walter you know I, uh, your son's a great hockey player. I wish he would have come to Detroit. <laughs> now you mentioned that there's some inserts that you guys kind of changed up the format a, a little bit uh, on those. And one of them that I had noticed is a card like this. So we have now limited logos that traditionally are auto patch cards and we have mm-hmm. a subset that are patch only. So what was the thinking there? Um, the thinking is we've made limited logos since you, can remember for the cup and it's always auto patch i understand that um so if we don't have an auto deal with somebody we can't make they can never have a limited logo card um in the title and and there's so many traditionalists there's so many old school people that are like this is how it has to be every single time uh if we did that with every single set there'd be no it'd get boring it, it really would. You can't just continue to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Now, yeah, there, there are certain things you can, but something like limited logos. Um, yep, I, I stepped on it. And you look at the, the name of the card, limited logos. What should be the star of the card? The star of the card is the patch. How many people have ever said, look at this beautiful signature on this limited logo card? All yeah. you always hear people say is check out this patch on this limited logo card. 
that's that's the star of the show that's that's what this card is made for so you know we wanted to make the, we wanted to make a version there's still signed limited logos you know they're they're signed and unsigned and that was done on purpose because i do understand the tradition of having signed versions but i wanted to make limited logos for players that have never had limited logo cards before because we don't have an autograph deal with them either they don't want to sign or they were asking 10 million dollars in autograph or you know we just can't get a hold of them whatever the reason so that's that's the purpose behind uh, the unsigned limited logos we're looking to on youtube here at a one of the new unsigned it's a dennis poppin and i just kind of make a this is just like a random comment but i love the uh game used jerseys of like the old ones that that aren't as quite a nice and perfect as the jerseys are today when you can just you can it, it you can tell how old the jersey is just by looking at the the quality i don't know it's just it's different than than jerseys oh here we had i remember a couple of years ago we used a grant fuhrer jersey in the patch and it was just like this old patch and it was like a l- little hairs of patch coming out and i'm like some people might not like that but i thought it looked awesome yeah another change on the or thing i noticed about limited logos is that the rookies are no longer are not game used is that the first time that that's the case or really does it say that on the back of the card yeah, it says, to... it says player worn on the one that I saw. Who who was it? Um, hold on, uh, I can look it up really, really quickly here on air production meeting. But I think <laughs> worth the uh, um, Cole Caulfield. Cole Caulfield. It says having play- worn by the feature player. And the as having more been worn by the feature player, so player worn, not game used. Hold on a second. Hey, Chad, are you there? Give me two seconds. Yeah, no worries. Oh, all my coordinators are gone. I can't tell. Um, no, as far as I know, all the all the limited logos. The direction was to use game use patch, so I can look into that um follow-up item that's all right yeah pretty much like that that's news to me because like i said i give specific direction that all the limited logos should be game used uh, and then a, a, another s- subset or, or s- set that has a little bit of a different flavor this year is honorable numbers yep so in it looks like that in some cases that now that you've kind of introduced the concept of a draft year versus the player's number is that for the same reason you're talking about with the other limited logos is to kind of mix it up a little bit and have a little bit of a different flavor yeah so how many different times do you want the same the same lim- the uh honorable numbers how many times David would be a yeah. good example how many times do you need it so let's mix it up there there's other numbers that these these players are are associated with whether it's their draft year or goals or wins or whatever um so yeah we we changed that up a little bit just because didn't want to just keep making the same card year after year and i know there have always been numbered to the jersey numbers we just wanted to to mix it up a little bit and i don't see how it's mixing it up in a bad way um so again the traditionalists i apologize but uh didn't want to make the same card for the fifth time. Well, I think rarely can you make a choice like that and please everybody because there are right. going to be traditionalists yeah. that that's going to bother, but then there are going to be on the flip side, there's going to probably be people that are itching for something new and maybe have a McDavid honorable numbers and would like a reason other than just to have multiple of kind of the basic same configuration of that it gives i guess another reason to get it so i to me it's one of those like 50 50 things yeah and we did something a few years ago where um we straight up said okay for three years uh you're only going to have a limited logo or a uh or honorable numbers once in this three-year period and you know and that's an option that's an option to do again but uh then that all of a sudden limits our coordinators of who they can put in checklists uh, if they need uh, a certain number of, you know, auto patch cards in the set, because, you know, the the 
the sequence is base card, rookie auto patch, another auto patch, um, auto, and then yeah. two wild cards at the end. So, you know, we need those auto patches. And if we're going to get those from honorable numbers, I don't want to limit our coordinator. Another card I want to ask about is the basics, which uh, I think is an example. Like you've talked about a lot about before, like how sometimes cards as you're, they're being designed or concepted uh, that they either exceed your expectations when they come, when that you see the final product, or maybe like in the case of, sorry, I'm going to bring it up chemical compositions. I know that that kind of fell short of what your, your expectations were. And then, that's, the, you know, that's what, the first I've ever heard of that. What? Yeah, no, first <laughs> you've heard of it. So when, when you guys released the sell sheet a few months ago or solicitation for the cup, uh, a lot of people kind of gravitated toward the basics cards because it was kind of the one of the newer inserts, uh, kind of had a you know pretty bold look and feel to it. And then you see today kind of the product in hand where you have that, like you said, that different three different colors of deco foil. So I would assume that this is one that exceeded your expectations from the concept to the final product. Is oh, that a I'm, good assumption? I'm still, I'm still hearing people complain about that card. I think it's a clean, beautiful card. Uh, I, I will stand by that. I, I, um, they're like, well, this doesn't belong in the cup. I'm like a card with three different color deco foils and it's clean. You know, I, I, I would argue with that. And, um, you know, there are people that will go online and someone won't like something and not everyone's sure. going to like this design. I get that. But then it's just like everybody jumps on the bandwagon. Like, oh, yeah, I don't like it too. I... Get one in hand before you make an opinion. Don't necessarily follow someone else's opinion uh, just because someone's complaining about something. So you want to agree with them and complain about it. And that's, you know, I worked in the restaurant business. And it's funny, like one table would complain about their food. And you just watch the chain of tables complaining about something because one table complained about it. Um but I, I think these cards look great in hand. Another one, if you go back to the previous screen where you got that that from, and, and like you mentioned, these people had this sheet, move the other direction. These people had this sheet and this was projected onto a screen from an image and they're basing their opinion off of a picture from a projector onto a screen. And that's where some of the comments originated. The one that you're looking at here, the, the player plaques, these are gorgeous. Those are pieces of metal that the, that the player signed that's embedded into the card. I think these are really cool. You know, you see a lot of uh, collectors will collect um, memorabilia or photos, and it has like a metal plaque uh, kind of describing something or an area for the for the the person to sign and that's kind of where that's based off you know we got an image it's got some description of the image and then an actual player plaque that the uh, a metal that the, the player signed those cards this two-dimensional uh digital version of it is not gonna is not gonna give sure. do the card justice at all what i like about this card is and i've talked about this with troy on our show before is i, I like cards that commemorate or are tied to maybe like a specific instance or date and time and so i think that's kind of neat where you're commemorating not just a great player like in the case that we're looking at the Anse kopitar uh player plaques but it's really the whole theme around the card is him uh you know winning the stanley cup right and they're in their six to one victory hoisting the cup and then you have him of course like you said he signed that that metal plaque uh, random kind of off the wall question, but we've talked to, I'm sure you've seen how uh, on the baseball side, right? Fanatics, because they make the baseball jerseys, they were able to put MLB debut patches on the Jersey and then put those into cards. Do you ever see something? Cause I, and the reason why I ask it now is because it, it fits that whole theme of commemorating a specific date and time. Like in your mind, what is the likelihood we ever see something like a, Connor Bedard um, patch, you know, you know, like a or or the Celebrini patch or something like that, where that that is super high end and comes from like maybe like their NHL debut game or something. Like that. Um, you know, to come out and do the exact same thing just really isn't necessarily our style. Uh, we sure. would kind of have to to come up and create some stuff on our own. Uh, we actually have done stuff for a couple of players um 
and it's going to be in in future products. Can't necessarily get into it yet, but uh, there there are some some things that uh, I think collectors will be pleasantly surprised and appreciate when it comes to like debuts for players and whatnot. But uh, great idea by by Tops and Fanatics. Um, obviously, having the ability to do that um, is is great. And, you know, hopefully yeah. we can work with with the league and the teams and and create something of our own. And I, I think that's the that's the key right there. Something of our own, not yeah. not a complete Making copy your own. of what they've done. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, another card I really want to get talk about that I noticed this morning, which I'm a huge fan of, is is finding alternate memorabilia to put, you know, patches are awesome. Of course, I'm not a big and I'll just admit, I'm not a big like button guy or or fight strap guy but something like this and i'm showing there's an an exquisite auto patch that's the what's that the o3 retro design it's gordy howe it's a 101 it has a sticker auto because well gordy's passed away of course but it has it, i'm assuming that's a, a piece of his glove yep in uh, the, we, we had some glove in uh stored away and uh there's the 101 version which is what i took the picture of i actually have like three more pictures of three of the other ones uh, because there's the out of 10 version also. And every time I saw one, I just wanted to take a picture because this is, this is honestly my favorite card of the set. Like I being a Red Wings fan and Mr. Hockey, I was lucky, fortunate enough to meet him once. And uh, I just, I love this card and um, yeah, to be able to find some unique memorabilia for him and put this in the card and, and give him, an exquisite uh, auto patch card like this is was amazing. Yeah, I hope that that cards like this kind of work and that people get. I, I can't imagine you won't get good feedback on a card like this, but um, yeah, it stood out to me too. It's a showstopper, that's for sure. I, I haven't I haven't heard any complaints. I, I haven't yet. So um, those traditionalists though will be like, "This should be a patch." No, just kidding. well, like I said, that's a catch twenty two. Uh, well, it, again, very logically a sticker auto, but I did see that today that there are some Zegras sticker autos in the yep. cup. Is is he the only key rookie that, that has that, or are there others too? Yeah, no, he's the only key rookie. Um, same situation that we had last year. We did everything that we could. I mean, play exactly what I played last year uh, at this time. Let's see if I say the pause. exact same thing. Yeah, but no, uh, we did everything that we could in our power to do so. We did. We we went many different uh, avenues to try to make it happen. Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't get together with the player to get the card signed um, for whatever reasons. And uh, we have sticker inventory, and we were able to get those signed uh, back th- uh, earlier. And so that is what we used on the cards. Uh, it's unfortunate. Obviously, we would love to have all these guys hard signed. Um, and it's been the tradition for the Cup to have all these guys gar- hard signed. For this to happen two years in a row is extremely disappointing. But uh, that being said, I think there's still beautiful cards. Um, I've, there's, you know, I think we posted one of the photos, but there's a number of other cards uh, that we have that are absolutely gorgeous that uh, a Zegers fan will definitely want, whether it's sticker or not. But, you know, it, it was nice to see that we got Raymond and Cider uh, pretty much last minute. Uh, Cole Caulfield, same thing, uh, that we were able to get these guys to sign uh, because, you know, as many hard sign rookies as we can that's what we want and we we want 100 percent. i mean we want the cup to be 100 percent, except for something like gordy howe or bobby hall or mike bossy sure. or someone like that um or you know those nine-way booklet cards that have you know we can't we don't have time for nine people to send it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth so yeah we'll use stickers for those but everything else um should be hard signed so it wasn't zegris's tiktok girlfriend that wouldn't let him sign i I'm not part of our talent acquisition team. I'll just leave it at that, <laughs> nor will I comment on it. You got my comment. It's the same as last year's. <laughs> I got you. Uh, okay, so you said that the Gordie Howe Exquisite uh, 101 is, is your favorite card. Do you have a favorite new card in the Cup this year? Favorite new card. tough question um you know i i really like those plaque cards i'm not gonna lie i thought those came out 
those came out real good as as a collector of autographs like that's something that i like to see when you bring in what other people collect into a set like that um it, hopefully it brings in more collectors uh because of it because this is the type of autographs that they collect so um i i really like that um you know what was a nice uh change of pace too is you know, you've got the signature renditions, but you also just had the regular rendition cards that had memorabilia. Um, again, it, we, we limit ourselves sometimes with inserts by just making them autograph only. And this that was one of the inserts where we have a lot of really cool moments uh, throughout the many, many years of hockey. And um, we can only do moments where we have guys that have signed in this set. So um, yeah. just doing mem versions of those cards I thought was 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 nice. Those can have a lot of value down the road too. So uh, PWCC is one of our sponsors and we uh, do like a show for their weekly auction for their hockey cards. And within the last, this month, somebody unloaded from 2005, there is a, a set of patch variation cards that I think had like 93 players and at least half were including like Gordie Howe and, you know, anywhere from Gretzky had had a variation too in there, and just memorabilia, no auto, um, and small patch that were in those the 2005 the Cup edition, and those cards have been selling for crazy amounts, and people, and and, and not just like the amount that they're selling for, but how chased they've been, uh, because that, that's a a subset that people really covet, and so I think that's another part too that you, you know you lose sight of in the moment when a set like this comes out is that some of these you know for there's set collectors and subset collectors that um can you know really covet those cards down the road yeah i'll tell you another uh, there's two more that are that are somewhat interesting you were talking about the uh sets that have different versions of them um you know we've made monumental patches now for a number of years and i remember getting a phone call a while ago saying billy you know we've got these hundred year patches that we'd like to use, but if we were to use them in the monument, oh, right there, if we would use them in the monumental, they won't fit. Can we do more of a horizontal where it opens differently? Like you see pictured, can we, can we do that? And I was just, you know, we changed it up uh, for the veterans. Usually the veterans are, you know, they're all kind of like opening up like, uh, like that. And this one, we, we changed where the spine was, and it was able to get some pretty cool, uh, some pretty cool hundred-year uh, patch cards. And then the other one that uh, that I really liked was um, oh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? I, I had the page open and everything. Oh, the dual ticket booklets. So we've done ticket booklets before. Like I don't want to just throw in a piece of a ticket stub. Like some of those cards are cool. Uh, but this is the cup. So in previous years, we did the ticket booklets where um, it was a ticket from a game and the player inscribed a specific stat. And I thought that was really yeah. cool. And that's that's very challenging for our talent acquisition team to to get done. And, and they they did a great job uh, the couple of years that we did that. I, I think one of the biggest ones, like we have a McDavid like first goal game and, and stuff. But I was like, well, let's let's step it up a little bit. You know, the tickets for two players against each other. You know, let's see if we can do a dual ticket booklet where um, we we take two players and have them sign it. You know, the stats, maybe yeah. someone doesn't want to put their stats on there from that game. You know, when we made the other tickets, we were trying to find guys that had good stats from the specific game. Or at least you can't just throw on someone that's just like, two penalty minutes and that's it like three shots <laughs> and two penalty minutes minus four yeah exactly so this one's kind of cool because it's got uh you know the two players signed it and that's a ticket um and you know like you were mentioning earlier um when you have something from a specific game from a specific moment like people tend to draw towards those type of cards and so this is one where you know it's a specific ticket from a specific game and uh, to have it signed by a player from each team, I think is pretty cool too. I'm just shocked there's still tickets available. <laughs> when when we went to the expo, I I, uh, I went to a Maple Leaf game, and the funny thing is, I went to Will Call because I thought my tickets would be there, and they're like, yeah, it's all digital in Toronto. I was like, what? I had to find a picture that I sent somebody of the tickets. And send it like give them a bunch of email. Like I gave them one email, it didn't work. I gave them another email. I showed them the picture. I think they just finally let me get the tickets because they felt bad. I'm like, here's my upper deck business card. It's for upper deck. And 
Uh, but yeah, it's, I know Toronto is completely digital. Like, I don't know if they give away tickets. So yeah, it's getting tougher and tougher to make cards like these. That's for sure. Might have to be retro or legends. And yeah. Might not be able which, to do which isn't too bad. No. Yeah. Which, which isn't bad. Or we could, or we could just put like the square, uh, <laughs> symbol or whatever that they, that Green you have shot. to scan, that you have to Somebody's scan, barcode. put that in the middle of it. Yeah somebody's phone another card that i wanted to bring up quick that i really like and I'm, i don't know if this is new sorry i don't know the checklist well enough but i really like these uh, day with the cup signatures yep and i uh, big fan of uh just kind of capturing that moment again where the the player you know, case ultimate victory right and hoisting the, the the stanley cup is this new or has this been yeah done it's it's new um grant always says uh try to give us a, a a few like i said we want to kind of bring some new stuff every year uh while still keep maintaining a lot of the traditional inserts and you know i build the flagship product and there's always some really cool pictures in uh in our flagship and i was just like well those cards don't get signed. And I think they'd be really cool if, if we had like signed day with the cup cards. So this was the perfect opportunity. Cause a lot of times, you know, these are throughout the year. Like I don't have to be specific to one year, you know, we can keep doing this insert. And I thought it was a, yeah. a nice addition. Um, and there's a perfect picture, happy Ovi. Um, you know, I, I, I really enjoy these cards also. Will there ever be a McDavid? <laughs> I hope so. Good for as good long for as it, as long as his dad doesn't tell him not to play for the Red Wings. Ooh, uh, you like your team this year? You happy with the? You got Kaner, Showtime. Um, we are. We, I, I told people I think we're going to be an eight, seven or eight seed, and we were. We were. This happens every. This has happened the last couple of years where we start off pretty good and then we kind of slip down. I just we can't afford that slip, and so uh, hopefully, I think they play uh, Winnipeg tonight um we need to we lost to philly 1-0 the other day and we need to get back in the win column so uh we can't uh we can't have any losing streaks you know if you want to be a playoff team you got to take care of business and um the younger players aren't as young anymore you know um raymond's having a nice raymond and cider having nice bounce back seasons you know they're not 100 point guys but they're definitely good players um i did get to see kane's first goal um with the Red Wings. So that was fun. Uh, he was really excited about that. And uh, yeah, I think they brought in some good veteran leadership too. So, so we'll see. We will see as long as we can stay healthy. I think you saw uh, like any team. When, when we, yeah, when we lost someone like Rasmussen last year, you know, you, you're, you're doesn't seem like a superstar, but when he's out of the lineup, uh, you know, you start seeing, you know, giving up a few extra goals here and there and those few extra goals in tight games cost you games. And that did a lot last year. Anything else about the cup before we wrap up and talk about what's next a little bit, man. Um, you know, as I said, I'm really excited about it. I think we did a good job trying to make sure that, uh, you know, there's value in each 10. Um, it, it's, it is one of those products. Like if you're just buying one tin, man, it, it's hit or miss. Um, you know, we, we build this at a, at a case level. So, um, you know, we, we hope that people will buy cases and be able to see a lot of nice cards in there. And, you know, the, the checklist is strong. And even I, I know people complain about past product stuff, but if we didn't have past product stuff, you wouldn't see any Crosby in there. If you notice a lot, there's a lot of Crosby, but it's a lot yeah. of 2021. Um, so, yeah, that's it's frustrating when there's older uh, stuff in there. I know people buy this to get the new cards, but guys like uh Crosby and Sackick, I believe, and there's a few others like big, big names that are past products. Um, well, I, you're not going to complain when you hit a Crosby auto, but if it's some guy you've never heard of, that's when. Yeah, yeah, and we we the, stay the, away from the challenge. We try to stay away from that. Like any any buddy that is a past product is is usually like we kind of rate A B, you know, case type cards. They're at least a B. Like that. we don't usually throw filler into the uh mix of past product is i got one more question on the cup is splendor could we expect that to be sort of a permanent set in the cup yeah we'd love to build it again um i i don't know if it has been built or not but uh uh if it's not being used 
in, as its own product, just like Exquisite. If Exquisite's not being used in its own product, you will find a home for it in the cup because they're both high-end products yeah. that, uh, you know, have very limited number of cards. So um, un unless I'm told otherwise, uh, I'll keep putting it in there. Now, as far as what's next, uh, we talked to Party Time Pat last week, and I think he's next with Ice. I think that's his new product in the first of January. But as far as hockey stuff that you work on, what do you have? What, what do you think's coming up soon? That's a good question. I mean, I know ever. Might as well just say when is Series Two coming out? Because <laughs> that's I know that's what everybody's um, really excited about. Um, are you are you the Parker's Champions guy? Parker's Champions, yes. Why has it been delayed 45 times? <laughs> um, we're trying to avoid a large number of redemptions. It's a hard sign product. Oh, and okay. so we're trying to um, make sure that people don't open it and there's too many redemption cards in there. So it just I like that we're... answer. I'm very, very excited about that. Yeah, so. we, very, we very have excited. we have and, and it's not for every product, but, you know, for something like that. We want to limit it to a, maybe a certain percentage if we have to use, um, if we have to use redemptions, and yeah. we're not. We we keep thinking stuff's coming in, and unfortunately, it doesn't. So we're not at that level yet. When we are, we're, obviously, we're as like we're as excited to get it out there as you guys are to get it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's just a waiting game. Um, yeah, that is one that uh, should be coming out soon. Let me let me peek here. I'm not gonna. I think it's a you, January. I'm January gonna, now. Yeah, I'm not going to necessarily give you dates, but I know I had um, a list of stuff coming out here soon, okay. or a list of stuff that uh, are. Yeah, I'm not. Basically, what I'm saying is I'm not giving you our calendar, but I can give you an, an up, a kind of a heads up of what might be coming out here soon, if it opens up. So you got to prep me on this these questions, so then I could, I could have this ready for you. Um. Let's see here. I know there's something come. Oh, Spider Man just came out. The cup came out. Um, Pat talked about ice. Yeah. Um, Good ones coming out. I know that. Yeah, I, I think in January you might see. Um, I, I think you might see some Fleer Ultra coming uh, on EPAC. Is that only EPAC again? Yeah. Yep. Okay. EPAC exclusive. And then um, there's there's other products uh, coming out. You, the problem with the holidays is, you know, we're not the, the people take breaks, so um, sure. you kind of have to to wait out. But uh, you know, you might see Opichi or credentials, or sure. I mean, UD two. Obviously, we're we're hoping for the end of February, probably end of February, early May, or early May, early March. Um, but we're hoping for the end of February on that. And then nobody else will care about any other product that comes out once series. You might as well just retire. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Your swan they'll, song. They'll be, up to, drop they'll, moment. they'll be up to like $400, $500 a box. And people will be calling me asking me why they're $500 ex expecting. Me, the, I'm the reason why the, the <laughs> box price went up. I got some advice for you. Don't buy a Lambo that week, Billy. Okay. <laughs> Right. yeah line. right right yeah really no, really yeah, customer like, service if you have any problems with stuff they just tried to uh peek in the back of my photo video bomb. here video he bomb. was probably he probably thought i was watching like some videos or something and uh wanted to see what i was watching because there's been a lot of breaks of the cup today so i've been online uh watching a bunch of them i got one more question for you and you don't have to give me a specific answer if you can't but uh just curious is there anything in the works that is i know you can't do SB Signature Edition Legends again, but is there anything in the works that's sort of in that vein? Yes. Yep. Um, you want to talk any more about that? You want to nope, spill all the beans? Can't. Uh, you know, we have our CDD conference. There might be some stuff that comes out there about what we're doing, but uh, I can't speak upon it now. Oh yeah, I'll check my invite. <laughs> uh, all right, man. Well, thank you. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, happy holidays. Congrats did, on getting the cup out there. Did everybody see what I got for like for those of you yeah, know sure Josh one. Josh interrupted our uh our our white elephant gift. Oh by the way, we're this is I got this uh at the hockey game I went to and uh what's his name when 
Larkin Mike almost Vernon. died, but we got our Mike Vernon helmet that they gave away. But this was this was my big get. I'm a Michigan State guy, and somebody threw in Magic Johnson winning the national championship right there. Um, so anyway, wait, well, what year is that from? Oh, it's gotta be seventy nine. Yeah, seventy nine. Yep, April second, seventy nine. But uh, anyway, thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Had a good time as always. Hopefully, they got all, you got all your questions answered. Um, I'll get back to you on on the Caulfield. Um, yeah. Again, I don't know the. I honestly don't know the answer. I know the direction that I gave, so I would be shocked sometimes um, when our type people in the back just see it's a rookie jersey. They assume that it's a photo shoot. So um, hopefully, we put the wrong uh, the wrong copy on it. But I'll find out for you and message you. All right, Billy. Happy holidays. I'm sure we'll All talk right. to you in the new year. All right. Thanks, Josh. Later, yeah. guys. Bye-bye. All right, Troy. Had a good conversation with Billy. You were... Yeah, tell me with... all about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going to listen to it later. I do have breaking news. What? So for those other than Troy who hasn't heard it, but everyone else <laughs> that has, I just got a message from Billy who did go back and follow up on the Rookie Limited logos. And in the so what happened is if you go to like well it'll be it's a story post but Mitch Grabman, yeah. the cup expert who's doing our cup masterclass had posted the uh, Cole Caulfield limited logos and showed the back that said the car was car that said the jersey was player worn. Now traditionally, yeah. all rookie limited logos are game used. Billy did confirm to me that all are game used, so it okay. is likely then I'm assuming an error in the printing on the back of the card. Okay. I wonder how that fixes itself. Is that just something that you have to like know in hobby lore now that it says player worn, but it's yeah, actually game used? Yeah, that's we that I news? gotta believe that's a big miss. Like, and it's I get it, mistakes happen. We're talking, about, we're talking about it all the time, but holy cow. I yeah, this that thing is you'll have our interview, you'll have posts about it, but you just gotta know it now because it's not like they're gonna reprint the cards or anything. You gotta listen to the gong show, I guess, right? <laughs> there you go. I want to roll into new product releases. Got to do an update, Troy, on, uh, on our artifacts redemption. All right. Um, of course, regarding potentially the player who shall not be named. <laughs> I have not seen any news regarding the matching of Roman numerals or redemption numbers or player numbers to specific players yet. There's no player match checklist out for 2023-24 artifacts redemptions. As many of you know, we hit two, you know, maybe, hopefully, possibly, Big redemptions in our artifacts box. Uh, we had an artifacts emerald jersey patch rookie auto redemption for Roman numeral one, and then also an artifacts retro rookie redemption number one as well. Now, many might assume that Roman numeral one and retro rookie redemption number one would be could be logically the player who shall not be named. <laughs> we will not name him in fear of jinxing our luck. But I did do some research, Troy, and because we have now that we now have a vested interest in this, so. We're taking everyone along for the journey here. <laughs> so I did some research into past sets and who was Roman numeral number one and retro rookie redemption number one. So we're going to start last year with 2022-23 artifacts. Roman numeral one was Maddie Beneers. He was the second overall draft pick in the 2021 NHL draft. But of course, is the headliner for the 2022-23 hobby class. So like many people think, well, it's always the number one draft pick. Well, not in the case of Beneers, but he was kind of the guy. I thought for... it was Slavkovsky. Slavkovsky is number two. Really? Yeah. I thought I looked all this up. Oh, okay. Well, look it up again in case I'm wrong. No. But then the year before, 2021-22 artifacts, Roman numeral one was Lucas Raymond, who was not the number one pick either. Zegris was Roman numeral, Roman numeral number two. Caulfield number three and cider number four. So now I'm all worried. Hmm. And, and looking at this. Going I was looking, school. I was looking at Roman numeral rookie redemptions material gold. That's what I saw. Yeah. That was Slavkowski. I can't even find. I don't it's even there, know what these, it, where I'm on Beckett. Uh go to cardboard connection. I think okay. Story of my life. Then in 2020, <laughs> 21. Artifacts Roman numeral number one was Laffy, who was the number one pick that year. So that way it worked out. And then Kaprizov was Roman numeral number two and Stutzel number three. 
And it tw- last one was 2019-20, so it was Roman numeral one was Jack Hughes. So it was in a nice, neat order, tidy order in 2019 and then 2020, and then it got a little bit wonky in 21 and 22. So not a distinct pattern, but and what I understand about why the checklist isn't out is that they want flexibility to put the guy as number one. At least maybe that's convenient logic on my part. But I guess my overall point is, Troy, is that you can't use like there's not a like I said, that distinct pattern. No, over there's, the last four or five years that tells you who this is going to be. There's not a distinct pattern. Plus, I think both of these sites are a disaster trying to figure this out because I'm looking right now and I see where it's veneers is Roman numeral one, but it says Roman numeral rookie autograph, silver redemption checklist. But if you go to the material, I don't even see any. And then emeralds aren't even listed underneath the, this is stupid. Like just release the stinking list. (laughs) Like this is, we should not be having to do this like detective work to figure mental gymnastics. Well, it's kind of stressful and it's, I was trying to think, is this a good thing? Or like sometimes a little mystery is a good thing. Right. Yeah. But I don't know. In this case, it's like it feels like torture. Well, <laughs> when you, yeah. When you have the I, cards, to be honest with you. And I get I we've I know why they do this, but oh my gosh. All right. Now the retro rookie redemption, number one, which is also the the other redemption we got last year was no, number one was Maddie Beneers again. So again, the same as Roman numeral, who is not the number one overall pick. Prior to that, there was not that this was, I think, a new card last year. So there wasn't more history to go back. And here's why I think it's, I, you know, you're following along with our stress and panic and fun here. And that's why part of why we're discussing it on the show. I guess it's fun to watch us freak out over it. Um, <laughs> secondly, though, we have these cards and I, I can't confidently say that I know it's him. Yeah. Right, the player who shall not be named. So Some... if you're like bidding, yeah, right now, I would be really careful on these on these cards. I think too, if you're selling, like uh, we've been like very try to be very careful about like we have them listed on my card post. Go check them out in our store. There, we do not name the player who shall not be named yeah. because I, I feel that that's kind of I would hate to sell this card under that presumption yeah and then you find out three weeks from now that it's like uh ridley greg and then you have a problem right because then the buyer is gonna not feel great and uh, but yeah i don't know so did, did did this anything in this conversation or what did it do decrease or increase your confidence that <laughs> I, I, I still i still think like logically right it has to be that guy that we yeah. will not name <laughs> Okay, along uh, this theme, I thought it would also be kind of interesting at this point. It's been about a week or so since Artifact. Well, has it been a week? No, it's been like five days. Yeah. Uh, since Artifact came out, well, let's look at some early sales, see what's kind of going on, see how people are reacting to the the first set with um, Connor Bedard. And I can say it because I'm not talking about it in <laughs> those cards. Now, per card letter sales history, Troy, there's been 709 sales already in the secondary markets. That's pretty good. A lot of interest in the set after five days. I thought we would do like a countdown, like the top five selling cards. We'll start at five, go to one, be a little suspenseful. Now, before we do, though, do you think, Troy, that there's any of the five will actually be a player card or would you guess all five will be redemptions? You, I'm guessing, I don't know. They're probably all freaking redemptions knowing our luck. I will say, okay, I'm going to get into right now. We're going to go through, but just one other thing that everyone needs to know. They're all eBay sales, but all were verified as paid in therapy. So we'll start with number five. Redemption. Rookie Redemption, gold, jersey, jersey, auto, Roman numeral number one. What is a jersey, jersey? That's it's the dual patch windows. Okay. So our, our card is a jersey and a patch. I need a job there. I can come up with better names than jersey, jersey. Jersey, Jersey, <laughs> right? So again, Roman numeral number one. I think presumed to be the player shall not be named. <laughs> that sold for six hundred and seventy-two US on December seventeenth. Okay. The number four sale is same card. Another one of these. 
the gold jersey jersey auto Roman numeral number one sold for 748 US dollars on December 18th. I also did because I think oh it's on Slap Sharks. There's an active auction of this card and it's well over a thousand US. Whoa. So these prices are all moving targets. Yeah. To begin with. And that's one of the things too. Well, and this is kind of relevant to us, and maybe you know we're we're here talking strategy live on the air here, but because I was going to say, if you own this card, well, we kind of do. We own another one Ooh. of these. Do you think it's better to sell it now or to wait and see if it's confirmed? Because I would it, once like it says on the checklist that guy, the player shall not be named. That then it's got to be like the prices have to go up at that point. You would think that, right? Oh, I would think so. Because now there's still a little bit of uncertainty put into it. So, and I believe in like good karma, right? And, and so, because I think the flip side of that is you might be thinking, well, what if it isn't the player who shall not be named? Then you could make more money selling it now. But I don't think I would be happy or satisfied. It wouldn't make me feel good to sell it yeah. for a bunch of money and then to find out it's Ridley Gregg. And I, I think I'd I actually reach out to that person and offer them <laughs> their money because you yeah. don't want to win that way. So yeah, moving target on this card. Number three, Sale Troy is a rookie redemption Chicago Blackhawks, which sold for eight hundred ninety-five. This US one, I'm, this one is intriguing because that would be like a big time, like upper deck middle finger, and not <laughs> have this one be. But there was hit. he was not the only Blackhawks draft pick. <laughs> yeah, I think the I think part of this is that you can't do that that would be just mean <laughs> number two sale is our card troy the first oh. sale of the green jersey patch auto roman numeral number one sold for 977 us on december 19th i'm just gonna i wouldn't sell it that low i think yeah. if it is him for a auto that has a patch way too low yeah but so i'm not gonna sell hold on for a little bit and then the number one sale is the one level up of our card. It's the Artifacts Rookie Redemption Purple Patch Patch. So we have Jersey Jersey, Jersey Patch, and Patch Patch. Right? So for 1500 US on December 16th. Hold on. So, yeah. I'm all confused. Just a sec. So there's four different levels of the Roman numeral card. There's so this gold. isn't our card, though. This is our card. This is a rookie relic. Ours is an autograph rookie relic oh. redemption. Oh, I'm wrong. Yeah, see, ours has an auto and a patch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ours has an auto. Okay, that's not our card. Sweet. Yes. And this I this one is I don't think this one would be above. I mean, is well, this that's a not an auto either? That's not no, an auto. It's a, either. It's a rookie rookie re rookie relic patch patch. Yeah, you really have oh, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, you have to look for the so ours is an auto suite. None of the autos have sold. Take ours, you gotta be... actually increase ours by 10 times. <laughs> One billion. <laughs> so here, here's another crazy stat. So of the 709 sales so far, Troy, the top 20 sales are all redemptions for the <laughs> presumed you know who. Yes. That has Our to last be thing. Like Record the like first that. time. All right, last thing, real quick, in new product releases is we have an updated Upper Deck release schedule. Uh, one little minor change. Got an email from Upper Deck that wanted to pass this info along. So, slight change to 2022 23 Upper Deck Ice. The release date now moved to 112, January 12th instead of January 10th. We also have Goodwin Champions coming out in early January, but I don't, is there hockey in that ever? There is, but it's usually, you know, it's an unlicensed. I think they might have had a Gretzky in it last time. I haven't looked at the checklist, but. Then another very quick note is that 2023-24 MVP hits EPAC today, December 21st. It's usually around noon Pacific time. Okay. In those rooms. So you're going to be on the site hitting, hitting the pounding the purchase button, Troy? Well, how much do you think it's going to be? Because. What's it? I don't, know, I don't, I don't know, know what it's at hobby right now. So I'll I just, just wonder if there'll be like any interesting Connor Bedard 
um, like redemption or not redemption, like e pack uh, achievement cards, yeah, or bounties or yeah, something, yeah, something like that. Okay, time for our PWCC weekly preview. PWCC, of course, is a gun show sponsor. We're super uh, thankful to them for their support of our show. A lot of crazy stuff ending right now. We got Slap Sharks auction ending tonight. The December premiere auction ends tonight. Six amazing hockey cards that will end. So don't wait. Hurry up. Go to pwccmarketplace.com to place your bids. I think Jeremy Lee's, I saw on Instagram, his McDavid PMG Blue, which is a beautiful looking card, is a rookie, is in the premiere auction this week. Hold on. Oh. I'm confused. Slap Sharks doesn't have an auction ending, do they? Yes, yeah, Thursday night. I thought they're on hiatus. Well, they are, but you were you were you not listening when we did the slap <laughs> I thought they, they were on hiatus forever. They are, but they're they they had they said, well, we're gonna do an auction, even though for like relistings, you know, for people like didn't pay or oh, something like that. Gotcha. And then for any things that came in pre-holiday that didn't make it into the the auction. But the yeah, but it's a huge auction. I don't know. I mean, for a hiatus, it's like a crazy auction. So <laughs> check them all out, folks. I mean, there's, I mean, it's Christmas. And there's I'm actually amazing, looking at it right now. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> amazing hockey I'm, cards going on. I'm done with the show. I'm gonna go. I didn't even know. I didn't even know they were doing. I think it. you were I done with the show a while ago. If you don't remember that. But. My gosh, I just I don't know. I'm so out of it. So th- there's uh, also a reminder to check out the weekly auction, of course, which we're going to talk about some of our favorite cards right now. There's a watch party this Sunday night at eight thirty. I won't be co-hosting it because it's Christmas Eve, but um, somebody, Troy, is talking to Jeremy about co-hosting it that is uh, f- uh, from our, our own little town here who is also in our Discord. Oh, really? Which is pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Leave that, a, leave that a mystery. You have to tune oh, in to see what it is. It is on, on, of course you know what it is on, <laughs> on Sunday night. But let's talk about the weekly. You know, I look through every card each week. We pick out our favorite vintage and modern cards to highlight and learn more about. Like you know, we always do, we're going to start with our favorite vintage cards. And the first one I picked, Troy, is a 1980 OPG Mark Messi, a rookie card, number 289. It's a BGS 10 pristine. Big card here, of course. Now, it's it's in this like weird era, because I always get confused about this, where... I think it's technically supposed to be a BVG slab now, and then they don't have subgrades, but then for a little bit, it was still a BGS slab. Ooh. This is why Beckett and any other company, you never do this stuff because it just yeah. confuses people. Yeah. You don't need a BVG versus BGS. Just have a slab. Yes. So, so we all, but uh, I'll get off my soapbox there. With any 70s, 80s OPG cards that have a Beckett 10 grade, though, the I think automatic assumption most people get is that it is a sheet cut card as, as opposed to a pack pulled card. So, you know, what are the ways that you would kind of maybe assume that are you look at the corners and edges and where you typically expect in a pack pulled 70s and 80s OPG card to have that OPG rough cut that now, Troy, you might think that that was because <laughs> it was cut by wires, but we no, know it was cut by blades. Just dull blades. Just dull dull blades. blades. And... <laughs> This card has like the most like crispest, cleanest like edges and corners that you mm-hmm. could possibly like perfect, right? Which would make sense that if you have a sheet and you now know that these cards are condition dependent, that you would like, you know, they say measure twice, cut once. This is like a measure 54,000 times, cut once and pray, yeah. right? And it looks like they got it probably right in this case. Again, it's all conjecture. Like, there's no way to truly know. But the other thing, too, and what's a bummer that there's not a subgrade is that usually in the cases where you have, like, then later than, like, 81 and beyond OPG cards, when you see a 10, you'll have 10 subgrades on corners, edges, and centering, and then, at like, a 9.5 on surface, and that's generally thought that the the reason why the one subgrade is lower is because the sheets were rolled up which sort of creates like an abrasive surface and kind of messed up the surface of the card a little bit so yeah now like i said you never know but i think most would presume this is a sheet cut card is that bad no right i know psa doesn't grade sheet cut cards but a lot of collectors accept them i think it just comes down to collector preference it's like if you like the maybe romantic idea of a card that was pulled out of a pack versus a card that was cut at a later date out of a sheet. 
then you'd probably prefer the rough cut. Now, if you like, if you want a, a, a 10, that's perfect. Because a BGS 10 rough cut card would not have perfect corners and edges because that was the whole point of a rough cut. Um, and, you know, again, it just comes down, I, I think, to preference there. No right or wrong answer. And we're both on the record, but we kind of prefer the rough cut, right? Like, would you take a PSA 10 or BGS 9.5 rough cut over a 10 pristine she cut car troy? Yeah, I'd probably, I'd, I don't know. I'm just not a big, I'd probably want the rough cut. Now, beyond that, uh, Mark Messier was pretty good at hockey, Troy. Is that breaking news? Or does everyone know that? He's got a ward named after himself. Oh, yeah. True, true, true. Troy, did you know he's the only player ever to captain two different Stanley Cup champion, champion teams, the Oilers and Rangers? I did. And when I originally read, read your note, I was in a panic attack. Because oh, it really? said two different NHL teams. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 no. It has to be Stanley Cup. So I typed that in. I don't know if that made any difference. You oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. He has an award named after him. It's the Mark Messier Leadership Award. Yep. Which is given to an individual in the sport who leads by example on the ice, motivates teammates, and is dedicated to community activities and charitable causes. It's kind of cool. Is he the only... Yeah. What other, probably the most recent player to have an award named after him? Well, he gets, I mean, he gets to give it out. Like, that's, there's definitely players get named awards after him, but he's the only one I think that actually awards his own award to whoever he wants. He sits third time, Troy, third all time in points 1,887 in 1,756 games played. His point total is only behind Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux. That right? Is Mario Lemieux second? He's not second in points, is he? I don't. Uh, doesn't. I don't think so. Am I on the well, struggle bus here? What's going on with me? You are. What's here? Let's. Let's just. Do I have a fever? Or all time point leaders? I don't think it's Lemieux. It's number two. It's the auger. <laughs> what is going yeah, on? It's one. Gretzky. Two. Yager. Three. Three. Messier. Yeah, I put. I was thinking. Yeah. Lemieux is eight. Yeah, Lemieux and Yager are buddies, so that's <laughs> at least I caught my own mistake. Now this one's crazy, Troy. Last active player to have played in the seventies. Wow. Also, the last active WHA player that played in the NHL. Ooh. Just a six-time Stanley Cup champion, yep. two-time Hart Trophy winner, played in the All-Star Game only sixteen times, <laughs> won the Con Smythe in nineteen eighty-four. And the last sale for a 1980-81 OPG Mark Messier. Now this one's a little tricky because you look at BGS 10 and then you there's like nothing. And then it's like, oh yeah, a lot of them are BVG 10. So again, thanks Beckett for making this yeah. really confusing. So the last sale was a BVG 10, July 2020 in the PWCC Weekly where it sold for $3,150. All-time high was a BGS 10. Again, the same thing that sold for 3,300 US in April 2017. Current bid 2,900 US. So, so here's what's like crazy about like the she cut versus rough cut thing on this card. Like a PSA 10, which again, PSA does not grade she cut cards, is like what, like 20 grand or something like that? Wow. I mean, it's a it, where you like a BGS 10 all time high sales 3,300. So I think that. Wow. Kind of shows you maybe what collectors prefer. Yeah. All right, you got the next one. All right, I do, Josh. I'm going back to the 1951 Parkhurst train, and okay. I'm going to bring up the card on the sh on the screen. And so it's a 1951 Parkhurst Penty Lund. Good old Penty Lund. Fun old name. Penty. PSA 6. I decided to do this card for a couple of reasons. One, Unique name, and I guess that's how I do cards now. I just like the name. I'm going to do your card. So if you have a crazy name, you're you're going to be on my PWCC weekly preview. Secondly, though, once I looked the player up on Hockey Reference, and I saw the one major award that he won, and then saw how short his playing career was, playing career was, I knew something had to happen. It was kind of just intrigued me on what happened with this guy. So that's is why it tragic. I'm not looking ahead. Is it tragedy? It. I mean, it's sad. It stinks. 
but it we'll we'll get into it. So do I need tissues? Am I gonna no, get I don't need emotional? Tissues. No, don't need tissues. It's emotional. But Penty Lund. So this is how I landed on the 1951 Penty Lund Parker's card. So before we get to the player and all that fun stuff, I'm gonna look at the card. Card obviously it looks really decent. I mean, it's a PSA six. Looks in good shape. However, way off center left to right. Let's <laughs> let's, let's let's not hide that fact. Like the left border is way chunkier than the right. Um, you can definitely see at the bottom. I'm gonna zoom in here for our YouTube friends. There's definitely some marks. There's some darkening, some lines. Like looks like almost some blue. I don't know if that's part of the printing plate. Maybe because you can see by a stick. There's a little registry issues there. Um, corners are definitely rounded, but they're not that bad. I mean, they're they're rounded, but they're not bad for how old this card is. And then Can I say something top, about that? Yeah, go ahead. You know what amazes me about, like, so how, how that the corners are, you're right, they're not perfect, but they're on, on par with, like, a lot of cards yeah. you pull today. Yeah. And remember, this set was collated in a cement mixer. <laughs> yep. So how That's are these corners that nice? If this thing was like flying around in a cement mixer for, <laughs> I know, I just love that. Um, if you're looking at the corners, the top right is probably the worst one, just from a chipping or a faded perspective. I don't know if you can see that on YouTube. Um, you can definitely see there's like a chunk, like some color missing up there. Um, besides that, card looks definitely good. There's marks here and there, but you know it's an old Parker's card. One thing I did notice that. If you look at his eye, there's like this white mark. And it threw me off because it looked like his eye was kind of crazy eyed on the picture. But I think it's just because there's this white line oh. that's on there. Was he coked but, out? You have I problem? hope not. I hope not. But yeah, so that's besides that, cards, I mean, great shape. PSA 6 looks really nice. Um, Definitely, I mean, and let's be honest, I haven't got you yet, but you're not going to pay a lot for this card. For a 51 Parkers, this probably isn't going to be one of the, the more expensive ones. But now, Josh, we have to learn about our boy, Penty Alexander Lund. Okay, ready. He won the 1948-49 Calder Trophy, Josh. He was Rookie of the Year. Wow. For, for his career, he had 44 goals, 55 assists for 99 points in 259 games played. He only played five seasons in the NHL, his first three with the Rangers and his last two with the Bruins. So obviously what happened? So here's what happened during the 51-52 season. Lund suffered an eye injury from a high stick. The injury was so severe that he almost lost all sight in his right eye. He attempted a comeback after being sidelined for three months, contributing 17 points with only one eye in 1952-53. Lund would skate for two seasons with Sault Ste. Marie before retiring from ice hockey altogether in 1955. Now, obviously, pretty crappy way to have to stop playing hockey. You never want to go out because of an injury, but I guess that's life. And I'm especially in the old days, I'm sure that happened more than <laughs> they like to care to admit because they were thugs. <laughs> it was brutal. They didn't have the equipment, the safety standards we have today, but that stinks. Have you ever noticed, like, now, like, because I was thinking, well, would that, could this happen in today's game? And they do have the eye shield, of course. Uh, yeah. What, 99.9% .9 of the helmets, like Ryan Reeves is, like, grandfathered in. Yeah, like, whoever's couple grandfathered other guys. in from the rule, yeah. But have you noticed, though, that so many of the players, like Kaprizov is one of them, they wear the helmet so high that, like, the the fa the eye shield is basically covering their forehead? Yeah. And that's So, I mean, it's like, could this happen today? This type yeah, of injury. Oh, I'm sure it could. I mean, right now, and another thing with the eye shields, like you said, I, I don't know if there's a standard on how deep they have to be, but I've seen some that are really thin. And if you get those one of those really? thin ones and put them up, and it's the same thing. I don't know if there's an NHL rule, but like on goalies, the chokers, the, the plastic flap that hangs down. Yeah. Goalies hate them. Usually they hate them. And what they'll do is they'll get it and they'll just put it so it goes right across the helmet. So it's not protecting their neck. It's just sitting right on their helmet um, for leagues that require them. And huh. speaking of leagues, did you see another guy almost got his neck sliced open from a skate? No. It was like a check no. at a bench, and the guy's skate flew up. It's like, of course, this stuff just comes in bunches once you start talking about it, or once something happens. It's crazy. So, yes, that's our boy, Pendy Lund. Quick fun fact about him. He's the first 
Finnish born player to score a goal in the NHL. There's a little debate if he's the first Finnish player to play in the NHL. There was another player before him that was born in Finland, but raised in Canada that played in the NHL. So who knows? Go figure. Sounds like happy drama. Happy drama. All right. This card being a PSA six has a pop of 32 with 99 copies graded higher, which kind of blew my mind. I didn't think there would be that many higher. Last sale of a PSA six I could find was on December 13th of 2023, Josh. Via eBay, verified in Terapeak for 120 US dollars. Current bid on this card is 37 US dollars. So it definitely will be affordable for a 51 Parkers. On the one eye Lund, huh? One eye Penty Lund. And then if you want to see the back, there it is. Blank back. Blank back. Okay, last vintage card. And I'm stretching vintage here, but I just had to pick it because I don't think we've talked about it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, was, I it's funny you said that because there is a Pelly Lindbergh PSA nine uh, rookie in the auction, and but I already talked about that card, so I was like, ah, I'm oh. not going to do it. But it, I was like, if I did it, I was trying to figure out where to slide, slot it in, and I was like, uh. but, but I found. I think answer. depending on our mood, we can slot it wherever we <laughs> have to make the rules here. Yeah, one good thing about having this show, it's a 1988 OPG Pierre Turgeon rookie card number 194 PSA ten gem mint. I don't, like I said, I, have we talked about him yet at all? I think so. I think he was he in the greatest numbers. He might be in the greatest numbers. What number was I it? forgot to do this too. While I'm talking, we look up at the pop count on this real quick because yeah. I want to. I think it's pretty low. Um, okay. So before we get to like Turgeon, though, we got to talk about this 1988 OPG and really the top set design too. It's it very like quintessential to the time. Features the name and logo at the top of the card. Like I said, late 80s, early 90s vibe, but most notably has a graphic of a thumbtack through the text box <laughs> that has a player's name. Are you a fan of this set, Troy? Or do you think it's like dumb and cheesy? I don't know. I've always thought it's kind of fun. It, it might be dumb and cheesy, but I've, I've been a fan of it. Do you want to know the pop now or do you want me to wait? Yeah, just give me the pop. All right. For the OPG, it's uh, 14. PSA 10 is a pop 14. Oh, no, no, no. Never mind. It is pop 78. Sorry. 78. Okay. Uh, I think I did look that up, but I just forgot to, to add it. Yeah. So I, I've, and I've honestly never been able to make up my mind on the set design. Sometimes I convince myself it's kind of, kind of like it. And then other times I'm like, oh, no, not for me. <laughs> but whether you like, whether you love the design or not, it's good to know that the, the other notable rookies in the 1988 OPG set were, besides Turgeon, are Red Hall. Joe Neuendijk, Brendan Shanahan, and Bob Probert. So a lot of big rookies in that set. Now, Turgeon Tri was the first overall pick in the 1987 NHL entry draft. Shanahan was taken second. And then a very young Joe Sackick drafted 15th. I guess 14 teams didn't need him, huh? Yep. I'm sure the North Stars were one of them. Probably. Probably had three picks before him. That's the <laughs> typical Minnesota, the way we do things here. <laughs> Turgeon played 19 seasons in the NHL for Buffalo, the Islanders, Canadians, Blues, Stars, and Avalanche. In his career, he scored 515 goals, added 812 assists for 1,327 points in 1,294 games, so more than a point-per-game guy. Now, this is kind of interesting, and I, I, I didn't know this about him. So his only international experience was in the 1987 World Junior Championships. Whereas part of Team Canada, he was disqualified from the competition along with the rest of his team and their opponents, the Soviet Union, or CCCP as the kids like to call him, for a bench-clearing brawl known as the Punch-Up in Pistani, I think it's called. Oh yeah, it's I know like, about this. This is Pistani, awesome. Czechoslovakia, which is now Slovakia, is like where the, the tournament was played. Yeah. Okay, so Troy, as the brawl ensued, he was the only Canadian player initially not to leave on the be the bench. So they're all fighting, and he's just sitting on the bench until the coach like looked at him like, "What are you doing?" and convinced him to get on the ice and go. <laughs> That's so hockey. I love it. So this angered a number of his teammates. I think to, probably to this day, and because they thought he failed to like come to their defense. Yeah. So here's a quote for I think it was a teammate Everett Sandy Pass. It's kind of a funny name. Uh, so anyways, he said, I'm looking for someone to help Stefan Wah out 
and I look over at the bench, and there's this dog, Tursion, just sitting there with his head down. He wouldn't get his, he says, the A butt off the bench. Mm-hmm. Just sitting there when everyone's off the Soviet bench, and at least one of our guys is in real trouble getting double teamed. Regarding not leaving the bench, that and so now Tursion stayed in 2017. That wasn't my job. I didn't have to fight. That's wow. a crazy, well, not a way to endear yourself to the ho- hockey culture, though, huh? Well, it's crazy that it's 2017. He's still talking about this. Like, people yeah. don't forget, man. I wonder how much that followed him into the NHL, too. Oh, like, I bet. If he got... I bet every every game. I bet someone would chirp him with it. I know I would. Or his <laughs> Canadian players would give him a little extra something when they went to well, check him, something like that. As far as major awards, Turgeon didn't win. He won a Lady Bing in 1993. He did play in five All-Star games. You don't see a lot of these cards. You don't see a lot of Turgeon cards being bought no. and sold. Doesn't seem like much of a hobby chase. I, he did make the Hall of Fame this year, right? So he's a Hall of Famer. Um, I'm kind of wondering now. I'm curious, like, what Canadian hockey fans. So I'm hoping people on Discord or other listeners or watchers of the show will comment and chime in. Like, you know, did this kind of have an effect? Did people sour on Turgeon because of it? Would love to know that. So let's say of a 1988 OBG Pierre Turgeon rookie card, PSA 10, top 78, was 455 US dollars on October 24th. All time high is $700 set in January of 2023. You got a current bid? It is a whopping 60 US dollars. Oh, steel territory there if you're a Turgeon fan. So, Josh, I got I to gotta pull this over at an on air production meeting. Look at this YouTube <laughs> thumbnail. That's the fight. In that game, so wow. if you watch that on YouTube, I mean, there's, I mean, everyone's out there. I don't know if Turgeon's still sitting over here, but man, it is looks crazy. Gloves everywhere, bodies flying, punching, oh, crazy. That is crazy. Oh, I just gave away stuff. All right, we're gonna move to modern. First card is OPG Platinum. Alexander Ovechkin Superstars Rainbow Auto NBA Authenticated. So this one stood out to me because I'm like, what the heck is this card? I'd never seen this card, and. One of the things I love about this hobby is there's so many cards out there, which could be a problem in some regards, but you tend to see new stuff every day. And I just think it's a wild looking card. It almost doesn't do it justice if you're watching too, because it's a die cut with about, well, I think I counted. There's, I think 20 corners on the card. And like, I almost wish it was on a white background so you could see all the die cuts a, a little bit better. My first thought, Troy, is, well, this, Stuff like this is usually like an e pack something, right? Yeah, I was like, oh, it's kind of, but no, it was an insert in the 2015 16 OPG Platinum Hobby boxes. So the base were the superstars that had no auto, they were one in 37 packs for a card. There's 18 players on the checklist, including Ovi, of course, but some other notables were Crosby, Stamkos, Johnny Toes, or Jonathan Taves, as the kids mm-hmm. know, Gretzky, Mike Bossy, and Bobby Hall. Nine of the 18 players had a rainbow autographs parallel, which this, the Ovechkin is one of those. Each ha- and each of those cards have individual pack odds. Now check this out. So the odds to pull this specific card, the superstars Ovechkin rainbow auto were one in 10,105 packs. Pretty tough odds there. Tougher than our Bedard. Yeah. No kidding. Oh, you, then our what? Oh, tougher than our not, player who shall not be mentioned. Stop it. So I'm not. I'm not tied by that rule. I'll talk about it all the time. Ruining it for us. Mm-hmm. Um, so the card itself looks like it's in really good shape. It's got, like I said, it's got wild edges in the corners because the die the die cut. Like uh, there's 30 corners or 20 <laughs> corners on the card, which is just crazy. Auto's pretty good, maybe a little blurry, but um, I didn't even kind of tough to tell from the. T- I really? totally missed the auto. I was like, where? And then I'm like, oh, there it is. <laughs> I haven't seen one of these cards in person, too, but I, I bet they've kind of pop in hand. You can tell there's kind of like that rainbow yeah. color effect to it. Also, a uh, pretty nice buyer's market right now, I think, for Ovi, since he can't seem to ever score goals again. Yeah. So might get a little bit of a discount there. Now, Troy, these cards are so rare that a 2015-16 OPG Platinum Ovechkin Superstars Rainbow Auto has not sold since October 2016. So what's that? Eight years ago? So for $53, huh. which is pretty crazy. It's um so it'll be a record sale. <laughs> and you got a current bid? 110 US dollars. 
It's only $110 for Novi Auto, and it's already doubled its all-time high. So, <laughs> there you go. Okay, you got the next one. I do. This will be the shortest one I've ever done, I think. You went Homer on it, huh? I did. I did the Homer bit. So I went with the 2020 SP Authentic Future Watch Kirill Kaprizov Patch Auto out of 100, BGS 8.5, BGS Population 1 of 6, 6 graded higher. You know I did this one because I saw the pricing, and I was like, hmm, that number looks pretty familiar. And you'll see once we get there why. But What, what card is this? It's a whop. Flop, 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 flop. So it's our boy. Whop, whop. It's a, a flop of our boy, Dollar Bill Carrill, which I don't ever heard people calling him lately. I think he's lost his luster with all like t shirts and everything. I don't know what's going on. But listen, I'm sick. <laughs> this is the wild first superstar. I saw this card. I'm like, yep, this is the one I'm doing. I don't have to do way too much in depth research on it. So obviously, I think the card actually looks really, really nice. Um, it's thick. It's obviously one of the thicker cards. I don't even care. I mean, I would almost crack this thing if I ever got it. I don't want, I don't need it in the BGS slab at all. And I still think yeah. horizontal cards and slab look ridiculous. The but auto's nice. The auto is fantastic. Can I, can I ask you a question? Is yeah. it now the, the patch is a two color patch, which, but it's a, it's like a name or number. It's probably a number it looks like. Yeah. Does it, we've talked about cards that like the Gila Fleur limited logos where it's a, Quebec Nordiques patch. Yeah. But it's Gila Fleur in the Canadians jersey. Yep. This is a, a lesser degree of that, but you have Kirill in the road white uniforms, but in the home green patch. Yeah. That, bo- that bothers me. I hate that. I maybe I'm oh, It doesn't bother me at all. What you know, this is this is really one of those weird cards because you know how I always say I love the frame. Yeah. Because However, these aren't game used. These are player worn. So I'm like, huh. What do you wear through a car wash or something? I don't know. Oh. It's like, how did it get frayed so bad? But I don't know. I, that's kind of an interesting thing. So I mean, I love frayed stuff on patches, but that just seems like a little bit weird. And I think I put the back in here just to make sure I was right. Worn by that featured player. So it's, uh, but again, back to the auto. Auto looks great. I wish it was a little more centered. But it's very clean, super clean auto. Looks great. Um, when it comes to sales of these cards, I was having the hardest time in the world trying to find comps. And I just could, wasn't searching the right thing until I just did. I had to put this out of 100 to find these. I don't know why it was so hard for me to find these, but then I found them all over the place. Yeah, because they, they, need, they don't like, they're labeled so different. Like yeah. each time, like there'll be SP authentic out of 100 a lot of times. Yep. And we just need some sort of like AI search where we can just like click a button and go Capri Soft flop. flop. And I was trying to do like the card number and that didn't work. That pulled up like the black one, the one of ones that are like 10,000 or 8,000. But I did finally find these cards. I obviously, all right, I didn't find any BGS sales, but I could find raw sales via eBay and on. Uh, July 13th of this year, the card sold for 1614 US dollars. That card had a three-color patch, though. And then on June 11th of this year, there was a sale for 1925 US dollars. Again, that card also had a three-color patch. The highest car- sale of this card I found on eBay was on July 3rd of 2022 for $3,868.22 US. The current bid on this, Josh, this is what drew me to it for <laughs> $700. US dollars, which is exactly like what I paid for his PS10 A10 Young Guns, which is now worth like 150, 120. Yeah, we I don't know what that. We so haven't looked on, our, on our last show. Were you did you have like a fever? Were you like considered like mentally you were intimating to me that he like might not be happy here? Is that still true? Because you never sent so. me the follow There was a vote. rumor that he sent a text to a buddy. So it's unsubstantiated that he just doesn't like it in Minnesota. That was the rumor. Maybe we should have him over for dinner and convince him <laughs> how. Maybe we can have him over and sign cards for us. That would be fun. Yeah, he'll love it then. Yeah, but anyway, right, last card. Hey, hey, I'll tell you this: if you're a curl guy, if you want a card, I'd go buy this one and crack it because it should it shouldn't go for that much. It might be go less than the last sale. So. It's a nice looking card. I really like. Yeah. It. Last card we're going to feature is the 2016 in the modern section OPG Platinum 
Matthew Kachuk, Ricky Otto, Red Prism out of 50, which is another Raw, but NBA authenticated. My second OPG Platinum card of the week. I had to pick a one because I'm kind of a Kachuk fan. I yeah. like him, and I like the color match on this card. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. Corners and edges look pretty good. Color match, of course, is awesome. One issue with the card, though, Troy. Kind of a big one. No mouth guard hanging out of his mouth. Oh, that's true. It almost looks like they've got photoshopped out because he's still got his mouth open like he's chewing on something, but it's not his mouth guard. I want every Austin Matthews card with a mustache, and I want every Matthew Kachuk card with a mouth guard hanging out. Mouth guard hanging out. That's how I roll. But it is a rookie card. It's out of 50, so pretty rare. Haven't checked in on the older Kachuk much of this season, and I was kind of curious as to I feel like, man, he must be doing a little quiet because he had an amazing year last year, right? Epic playoff run. Well, Troy, to date, in 31 games, he's only got five goals. It's like I, on my, I only know about him because he's on my fantasy team, and I sit there and bench him all the time. He does have 17 assists for 22 points. Uh, big drop off from the last couple of years. Last season, he had 40 goals. Nope. He's pacing for, what, 15? He had 109 points last year. Season before that, he had 42 goals and 104 points. So he's pacing for 13 goals and 58 points. Uh, oh, very Huberdo. Very Huberdoian. Huberdoian. <laughs> now many think he might still be recovering from a fractured sternum that he suffered in the Stanley Cup Finals. Uh, there's like uh it's who's Paul, who's the coach of the why why am I blanking? Paul Maurice? Paul Maurice, yeah. I was thinking Paul Martin for me. Um Paul <laughs> Maurice was like it's kind of like been defending him in the press a little bit, saying, Well, he's playing more of a defensive game this year. Uh probably still a little bit hurt, is what I would guess. Yeah. I'm still pretty confident, though, in the long-term play of the 26-year-old Kachuk. Uh, figure he'll heat up again at some point. To break your sternum and play hockey, you would yeah. suck. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that. Right now, the Panthers are fourth in the Eastern Conference at 38 points, so maybe he'll heat up through the second half of the season. Last sale, Troy, of a 2016 OPG Platinum. Matthew Kachuk, Red Prism Auto. Rookie was another raw copy. It's over 224 in a November. All-time high for a raw copy is 375 U.S., this past August, you got a current bid? 52 US dollars. Ooh, I'd be in at that price. Yeah, I'm wondering. It's kind of wondering what happens with these auctions near the holidays. Like they're during Christmas, which we know is celebrated around the world usually. Sure. Like, do they? I, it, it's like two ways it could go, right? It's like people are sleeping or they're doing things. They're not worried about the auction or everyone's trying to get good deals. So everyone's going in and watch, watching these auctions. We're using to check it out though. So be sure to go to yeah. pwccmarketplace.com, bid on the December premiere cards that end tonight, and then of course the week cards in the current weekly auction. Okay, personal pickups. Uh for the first time in months, <laughs> a month, we both have something. So kind of excited. This might, to try it. Mine might not be count because I really didn't like go personally pick it up, but finally ventured outside my house to grab the mail in my stupor and got an envelope in there. And I looked who it was from. It was from our good friend, friend of the show, California Dave. California Act- Dave. Shout out California to Dave. Dave. Yeah. Uh, met him at the expo. He's an awesome guy. But I opened it up, and there's this card. A Jill's Melage Upper Deck Canvas, what they call it, Sig- or, uh, Canvas Legends from the SP Signature Edition Legends. I freaking love this card. It's a goalie. It's Jill's Melage for the North Stars. But what makes it significant is that I did a trade with California Dave, I don't know, a couple months ago where I ended up receiving from him a Jill's Melash autograph. So he said once he pulled the upper deck or the UD canvas one, he's like, I knew exactly where it had to go. So thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. This is going right in the collection. I love this so much. Thank you. You have quite the Jules Malash PC that you're building there, Troy. Dude, Jules Malash is awesome. He didn't even play for the North Stars that long. But and it, you know what's funny, too, is that my mom was like a Jules Malash fan. That's probably where I was a Jules Malash oh, really? fan. Yeah. She got the hots for Jill Jules. <laughs> I there, guess, or... there you go. Funny thing about like uh, our good friend. I think he's a good friend, even though we met him for two days. But it was fun <laughs> two days. Uh, California Dave. His name is David, number one. It yeah. happens to be for California. We just tend to give people names here on the show. Just like you'll see, Troy, when you listen to the... Uh, oh, this is funny. When you listen to our interview with Billy, I've been texting with Billy a little bit because last week, of course, we had Patrick, yeah. the Artifacts product manager on the show. 
and he's kind of like a you know he's like a big like giant he's a huge dude like a giant guy Uh and one of the in the parallels it is party time and so i thought well let's call him party time pat (laughs) and so i told billy that and he walked by in the interview and uh we started together calling him party time pat (laughs) just be careful you come on the show you're gonna end up with a weird name yeah Okay, now I have a personal pickup too, and it's kind of a first for me. So if you caught our last PWCC Weekly Watch Party show on Jeremy Lee's uh, YouTube lo- uh, Sports Card Live channel, which is 8.30 on Sunday nights, for the first time, I attempted to buy a card <laughs> while doing my co-hosting gig. And I was so distracted. But this card, I'm still kind of confused by why it doesn't sell. I-, I didn't get like a super good deal. It's actually kind of what it's worth. But Troy, it's a 2003, or 2002, 2003 premiere I believe it's the first year premiere. Um, Wayne Gretzky premiere patch out of 25. It's a raw NBA authenticated. It was 174 US dollars. Here's the thing. It's a game used Wayne Gretzky patch. Yeah. Now, doesn't it seem like that it would be worth more than 175 bucks? Is that an all-star or, jersey? It's, it is an all-star jersey. It okay. says it on the back. But, oh, no. But and there's no more like game used Gretzky jerseys. Yeah, right? I don't think that those are. So I just thought, wow. Well, and I don't really care what it's worth, but I'm yeah. like, I get to own a game used Gretzky patch, and I can afford it. So that's kind of cool. The only yeah. thing you got to zoom in. You see where it says T on patch? T on patch. Okay. I can't figure out if that's like something. Now I thought it was a reflection when I saw it. I think it might be too because PWCC does one of the nice things they do is they do like a heat map. Yeah. And it didn't show up on there. So I'm a little nervous about when I get it at home about that. But I don't know. I still think it's kind of cool to, to pick up the car. Yeah, I think I, I thought that was a reflection when I first saw it. So hopefully, okay. hopefully that's what it is. Hey, and I just let me do this because I'm an idiot. When I was talking about my cards, I had the screen still up. So I'm just going to show that again. So it's a bigger picture so people can see it. That mask joke. is crazy. I know. Look at this picture. It's just awesome. Like, how, do you, how can you not love this? It looks then, like yeah. he has like a big yellow mustache. It does. And then the other one, the, the auto. Yeah, there so go. there we go. All right, Troy. That's our show. Remember, Masterclass, the cup part three on Christmas Day. And then we'll be back on Thursday of next week. If you like the episode, please leave a rating and review on Apple, Spotify, whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show, you want to support us, maybe give us a little Christmas present. Uh, sign up for our Patreon. Join our Discord. It's five dollars a month. Join our one ninety nine support level tier on Patreon. Link is in the show description or YouTube description. It's on our website and the Become a Patron link. You go to Patreon's website, p a t r e o n dot com, and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. It's also in our Instagram and TikTok profile. We are on social media. Hey, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and of course, subscribe to us on YouTube. And Troy, the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a production of Dollar Box Ventures LLC. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas for everyone that celebrates Christmas. And we will see you all next week.